There you go. You're all set. Okay. So welcome all who are here. Uh, this is the Environmental Protection Committee. I'm Alice Blank, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined here by Wendy Chapman, Co-Chair, and Diana Sweetire, the Director of Planning at CB1. And tonight, actually, really interesting ag agenda items. Um, we're probably going to hear a little bit about the Lower Manhattan water quality. And this came up specifically because there were two items that kept sort of circling around. One was that there were these tremendous number of fish in the Hudson River a few months ago that I think they were called the Menahadian. Forgive me if I have that wrong, Rachel. And it, it, there was this just tremendous amount of dead fish. So we all wanted to know more about that. And then it's about the same time we were hearing complaints, including my own, about a very odd tasting water. Um, that many that I thought it was just in my head, but it then ultimately became something where many people recognized that there was something different about the taste of the water, and indeed there was. And we were concerned was there any relationship between these two items, um, of which we've now been assured there was not. Nonetheless, we would love to hear more about it and generally just allowing community and folks uh, to ask questions about our water quality downtown and elsewhere. So I think we're starting with um, the Hudson River, and this is going to be with Rachel Sysak, who is with the Division of Marine Resources at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and I think Rachel has a presentation for us. Is that correct, Rachel? Is Rachel with us? I see Rachel's on. Oh, there she goes. Yes, I am here and I can start sharing as soon as you're ready. Uh, no time like the present. Okay. Uh, welcome, Rachel, and so many thanks for coming. Really interested to hear more about what's going on in the river. Yes, thank about you so fish. much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, so as you introduced, my name is Rachel Sizak, and I am the unit leader for the Marine Finfish Unit at the Division of Marine Resources. And we're one of several units that actually respond to fish kill events uh, for the Marine District of New York. But my unit was the lead on this particular uh, fish kill for the dead fish that you saw here in 2020. Um, and I'm just gonna talk just a little bit about some of our preliminary findings and just give a bit of background to, to give it all context. So Atlantic Menhaden, uh, there are billions of Menhaden, um, which is also referred to as bunker, uh, which occupy the coastal waters from Nova Scotia to Florida. And it's actually believed that they are one large population of fish. Uh, they spawn in Southern waters and then they migrate North and adult and juvenile Menhaden form these very large near surface schools in estuaries and near shore waters in the ocean from about early spring through early winter here in New York. And these schools can consist of hundreds to thousands of Menhaden. Now they're a very important forage fish for a lot of species. They're eaten by marine mammals, seabirds, sharks, bluefish, striped bass, and that's really just to name a few. Um, they're also harvested by humans, uh, mostly through bait and reduction fisheries, which basically take the menhaden and reduce them into things like fish oil, fertilizer, and fish meal. Now, this graph on the right-hand side is really just to give you an idea of how many menhaden are out there. Um, the thick green background is kind of showing um, that the biomass of the species is somewhere in you know, around the three to four millions of metric tons of fish. And that blue line is showing how many baby fish recruit into uh, adult spawners every year. And that's somewhere between 100 to 200 billion of billion fish that recruit into the population every year. So Menhaden are managed through state regulations and an interstate fishery management plan through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And that sets limits on how many fish can be harvested and what types of gears can be used to take them. And the quotas for how much coastwide harvest uh, can be taken are set annually. 
And New York, New York harvests a relatively small amount of menhaden compared to the coastwide total. As you can see from this chart here, this is the 2021 through 2022 total allowable catch. And that's around 424 million fish that can be harvested along the coast each year. And New York only gets 0.69% of that. Most of the harvest is uh, happening down in Virginia. They harvest about 79% of the total allowable catch of Manhattan. So the population status for Manhattan as of the 2020 benchmark stock assessment indicates that they're not overfished and nor is overfishing occurring. And this assessment used both single species where it looked at just Atlantic Manhattan on their own. And it also used an ecosystem based approach to consider the impacts um, of this species that are linked uh, uh, to other species that are linked to Manhattan abundance. So the current population size is very robust and it's estimated to be in the multiple billions of fish. And if anybody's kind of interested in more data on that assessment, um, that can be found at the website below at uh, asmfc.org. And I wanted to play a short uh, video here just to give you an idea of the scope of Atlantic Manhattan. And this is actually a video of a humpback whale feeding on a very large school of bunker. Now, uh, this was this is a uh, drone footage that was taken off of uh, off of the south shore of Long Island out east. And this is a very typical scene for the summers offshore of New York. Um, there are many of these schools or bait pods they're sometimes referred to. And uh, as you can see, humpback whales really enjoy them. And even from this uh, particular footage, you can kind of see it extends past the view of the screen, but this there's uh, probably roughly thousands of Manhattan that are in this school. So, uh, fish kill events are not uncommon for Atlantic Manhattan. Um, there are various natural causes for these events, and you know we typically see at least one annually. Uh, fish that swim in large schools are particularly vulnerable to low dissolved oxygen, certain environmental pressures, and also pathogens. Now, fish kills that are due to low dissolved oxygen are more common during the summer when water temperatures are very high. And fish kills uh, for Manhattan due to cold shock when the water temperature basically plummets very rapidly are more common during the early winter and uh, the fall. So DEC response to fish kills, they can be reported to DEC by phone at 631-444-0495 um, or the email we have listed here, marinefisheries at dec.ny.gov. Um, we are working on getting a um, more mobile online version of, uh, of the system in place, but right now that's how you can report. And we collect information basically on the location, the affected species, and any additional details that the reporter is able to provide us with. And then from that, staff kind of evaluate the information to see um, how we might respond. And we have a couple of different ways we might respond based on our evaluation. That can be anything from additional monitoring, uh, on-site response, uh, the collection of environmental data, uh, specimen collection of actual dead fish, and then sending those fish out for lab pathology. So now the event that um, we're here to talk about is the 2020 fish kill event. And reports of dead and dying Manhattan were first received in early November. Um, DEC staff deployed to multiple sites around the island where they collected environmental data and fish samples. And the Riverkeeper organization also assisted us with collecting samples in the Hudson River. 
Now, those samples from Eastern Long Island and the Hudson were sent to the Marine Animal Disease Lab at Stony Brook University for some initial pathology work. They did a necropsy and then they prepped all of the tissue samples to be sent to Cornell University for analysis. Now, there were several factors um, that made this event different from the typical low dissolved oxygen or cold shock event that we usually see. Um, and those events are typically localized to a particular geographic range or a particular body of water. And this event was very widespread. It stretched all the way from Rhode Island uh, through Southern New Jersey. Uh, the other thing is that low dissolved oxygen events typically occur during a very narrow period of time um, but this event started in an um, environmental data that we collected from the areas where fish were actively dying didn't show, you know, consistent level low dissolved oxygen, and it also didn't show us temperatures that could induce a cold shock. So what were we seeing? Um, one of the big things with this was that we were seeing unusual swimming behavior of the dying fish uh, throughout the region. I'll play a short now so you can see what we were seeing. Um, so there was basically the sort of corkscrewing, spiraling behavior that we were seeing from um, most of the dying fish. And this is true, you know, Rhode Island again through New Jersey, we're seeing this same behavior. So based on this behavior, samples of Van Hayden tissue were highly analyzed for a viral infection, which is often associated with irregular swimming behavior. Uh, samples that were collected both in New York State and New Jersey, though, tested negative for the virus. Now, the New Jersey Pequest Aquatic Animal Health Laboratory cites brain hemorrhaging ultimately as the cause for that circling behavior that we saw. And further analysis of the tissues um, by that lab is still ongoing right now, but they basically found very high levels of Vibrio bacteria in the samples. And that's being attributed to at least part of the cause of this mortality event. Now, New York, we still have our samples that are being processed as well. So we're working basically to confirm that assessment uh, with our own samples. Uh, Vibrio bacteria are a naturally occurring bacteria in coastal waters, and they're typically present in elevated concentrations between May and October. So the reports of the dead fish that began in 2020 ceased in January of 2021, and ultimately, you know, the kill spread out about two and a half months. Um, we're continuing to monitor the situation and work collaboratively with neighboring states and the ASMFC to identify various factors and causes related to these fish kills. You know, while we do know that uh, this Vibrio bacteria might be part of the cause, we're not quite sure yet until we look into it a bit more why that might have been at play. Because like I mentioned, they are naturally occurring uh, bacteria species. Um, it's estimated that this event has affected tens of thousands of menhaden, which is uh, actually a relatively small percentage of the population, you know, compared to the hundreds of millions of fish that are harvested by bait fisheries and redu reduction fisheries every year coastwide. Um, this is also, uh, I think it was more the geographic scope that made this particular and the fact that it lasted for so long made it unusual from the th type of things we usually see. So that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions if any of you would like uh, to ask any. Rachel, thanks very much. Really interesting. Um, well, I, I, I'm i gonna open up for questions. I have one, when you say the geographic scope, could you just um, opine a little on that? What do you mean? Just the specificity of where they were. In so, terms of so it's this kill uh, stretched from Rhode Island to New Jersey. So right. the amount of fish that we were seeing dead here on the beaches in the Hudson and the beaches, um, you know, we had reports from the North Shore of Long Island, the South Shore of Long Island, and in the bays. 
So we really saw it everywhere here. They also saw it um, to the same extent, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey. Right. And that was somewhat unusual is what you're saying. Correct. The length of time that it lasted and the, is that because it's such a large scope? Such a large area? Is that what you meant by saying that it was unusual? Um, so usually what we're seeing, the, the types of things that we see that happen on an annual sort of basis are isolated to particular bodies of water over a very narrow window of time. Okay. So New Jersey might have a river where they see, you know, a thousand dead fish from a low oxygen event, but that wouldn't affect anything here in our waters. Um, so that's that's what I mean by unusual. The the usual events that we typically see are usually either a low dissolved oxygen or a cold shock event in the fall. But something like this has happened previously. This sort of naturally occurring bacteria with this number of fish in this geographic area is this unprecedented or this has happened. Um, I would say that the number, uh, so I'd say that the, the scope of this is not unprecedented. Um, what is interesting is that we're in a time where, you know, we have more resources available. The science is always getting better, you know, so we're able to analyze fish samples in a way now that we might not have been able to in the, you know, in the past, but certainly this is not, um, the number of fish, it's not unusual, uh, in the over the scope of Menhaden for something like this to have happened. Um, well, I want to open it up to questions specifically on this, and then I just wanted to ask if you would close with talking a little bit about how the Hudson River is doing generally. Um, uh, do we have any questions? I don't see any hands raised from from the community board members here. Um, hey, Alice, this is Wendy. I'm. Good. Is it only this species of fish, or was it? Uh, does this bacteria all the also bother other types of fish? So this kill was just Atlantic Manhattan. We weren't seeing any other species of fish, which is actually reassuring. Um, it's usually the things that we worry about or when it's affecting a wider range of species, that usually gives us more concern. Um, there are, uh, I'm not quite sure how many species, but there's a least 20 that are known to, uh, I guess, regularly affect um, people as far as Vibrio bacteria. Usually um, when they tell you that it's important that you cook your shellfish, um, some of that can be due to Vibrio bacteria. Um, it is a common bacteria that's out there in marine uh, and salty brackish water environments. So as far as being the result of like a kill in another species that I'm not sure about. Um, you know, we're only just kind of starting the process of investigating this one. Um, we only found out that they found this Vibrio bacteria in this tissues earlier this week. Um, so the, the research is really ongoing still for this, but uh, there are many species of Vibrio bacteria out there. Um, most don't really cause any issues, um, but they can, uh, especially in higher quantities. Um, and if you're not cooking the food that you are bringing in from the marine environment. Hmm. Are there other issues that have been identified already? I mean, I didn't realize this is only um, well week old news. That's actually quite interesting because of course, most of the earlier reports were blaming it on you know, temperature of the water or the deoxygenation or or such, but um, so it sounds like that wasn't correct, but uh, are there other ramifications that have been identified uh, by DEC that, you know, other kinds of fish or other problems that they've seen already or other anomalies that now are, you know, understood because of this finding? Um, no, I mean, uh, so I guess part of this is that uh, everyone wanted answers right away, but it takes quite a, a long time to run the pathology on those tissue samples. So they're basically taking samples and trying to grow bacteria on them in the lab or trying to 
assess whether there's a virus in them in the lab, and that analysis can take quite a long time. Um, so uh, I think that's probably why there was some initial concern that, yeah, it might have just been what we usually see, which is that low dissolved oxygen kill. Now, as far as uh, this leading to other conclusions, you know, we monitored um, a lot of sites very closely. We didn't see any other fish that were affected by this. Um, Menhaden, like I said, it's a school of thousands of fish that are in very close contact with each other. So it's really easy for any pathogen to spread. They're also feeding on um, plankton, which are what typically carry uh, Vibrio bacteria in the environment. Um, plankton's usually and algae blooms are, are where that usually lives. So um, I, it would be way too early for me to make any conclusions about ultimately what this might mean and you know we might not see any of this again or it might be something that pops up again later in the future but this time we'll be able to kind of start from a different point because now we already know what might be causing that corkscrewing behavior and we'll know to look early on for uh vibrio bacteria okay. as a possible cause yeah uh, it would be great to circle back with you at some point. Can you just give a few minutes uh, just to speak a little bit about the health of the Hudson River and generally? Sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, the health of the Hudson River, that's a very complex question, and it depends on exactly what uh, you're wondering is healthy. I mean, the Hudson River is a very, it's a thriving environment that has um, quite a few nursery habitats in, in it, and different species are at different levels depending on different things. So it's hard for me to kind of go, yeah, the Hudson's doing good or the Hudson's doing bad because it's kind of a more complex question than that. I'd say that overall, um, you know, just big picture things. Uh, I think we are doing a better job with um, regulating our environment. Um, you know, the Hudson River has had historically, you know, lots of things that weren't regulated and things that made its way into the water system that we might have wanted, but I think we do a better job of that today. And, you know, it's, like I said, a very complex question, is the Hudson yeah, River healthy? <laughs> but, um, <Sorry. laughs> no, it's okay. Um, but I mean, there there are a lot of species that are thriving and it is a nursery habitat for a lot of fish. Um, you know, you have things like striped bass, blue crabs, you know, all sorts of marine species that are thriving in that environment. Um, but, but as to, is it doing well? It's hard, you know, that's, I wouldn't want to answer that. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Would you <laughs> eat any fish that are caught off the tip of Southern Manhattan? Um, so, yeah, there are fish that it's totally healthy to eat that are caught in those locations. Um, what I usually tell people is that you don't want to eat any filtration organs. So you want to make sure if you're eating crabs that you're taking out that tamale, that like green thing in there, because that's their liver. That's what they're using to filter any of the toxins they encounter in their environment. Um, and then for fish, you know, to make sure that you're thoroughly cooking things. And again, don't eat any of their filtration organs. Um, and, you know, follow the number, you know, there's guidelines out there for how many you should healthily eat. And I say to follow those things. Um, Rachel, thank you very, very much. Sure. Um, this does seem to me that would require, which I think originally we had a quite a bit of time on the Hudson River, but tonight, alas, once again, a pretty full agenda. I just will open it up one last time for anything um, for Rachel Sysak from the board or outside of the board. Okay. Well, lovely to meet you. We'll look forward to hearing the next series of findings. Um, I hope you'll keep in touch and let us know what's going on. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, and thanks very much. Oh, um, thank you for having me. Great. All right. So on to um, other parts of the water quality question. Um, and this uh, is a presentation by Adam Bosch, the Director of Public Affairs for the New York City Environmental Protection Bureau of Water Supply. So welcome, Adam. And uh, I suspect you've sure. been, I don't know if you're a visual presentation or. Yeah. 
we're heavy on the chemistry and biology tonight, I can see on the on the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see here. Okay, this should in a moment you should be able to see my screen. Let me know if you do. Perfect, we do. Right. Great, and I'll just double down with what uh, the previous speaker said. So we see uh, fish kills in the reservoirs as well, in New York City's reservoirs from time to time. It happens rarely, but it happens every handful of years or more. And as she said, for our reservoir supply, it's usually the result of anoxia, right? Not enough oxygen in certain layers of the reservoirs. Or when we get a very early season cold snap that lasts multiple days and uh, and that uh, creates some problems as well. So, so certainly something we see in the reservoirs as well. So, all right, uh, we're gonna talk tonight about uh, water quality, drinking water quality, and specifically the, the taste and odor issue that many of you noticed probably starting sometime around uh, the transition from fall to winter. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a water supply overview, just get everybody up to date on where your drinking water comes from and the three systems that help sustain New York City in terms of drinking water. I'm gonna talk about some capital projects. It's important to understand sort of the uh, capital projects we're working on that lead us to have to operate the water supply system differently in recent years and in some years coming up. Uh, we're gonna talk about our Croton system and the way that that's operated, the taste and odor complaints that we saw and some of the, uh, uh, the science behind why that happens and the research that we're doing into not only the causes, but the um, potential solutions. And then at the end, I'm gonna do a little bit of end of winter story time. Hopefully I'll have some time here. So uh, you may have seen this map before. This is the New York City water supply system, right? We're a surface water supply, uh, 19 reservoirs and three lakes in the system. Uh, total storage is about 570 billion gallons when the system is full. And we serve, this should be actually now 9.3 million consumers, about 8.3 million people in New York City and about another 1 million people living north of the city in 72 communities along the route of the aqueducts. Um, we deliver about 1.1 billion gallons of water per day to those 9.3 million people. And that water is collected from a uh, land mass area of about 1.2 million acres. So that's about uh, 200,000 acres, largely in Westchester and Putnam County, east of the Hudson River and about 1 million acres in the Catskills. And of course, we are the nation's largest municipal water supply. We're also the nation's largest unfiltered water supply. 90% of the water in a typical day that comes into New York City is unfiltered. And it's worth noting that the system is considered a marvel of modern engineering because all of this water comes to the city uh, by gravity alone. And in fact, the force of gravity is not only enough to get the water into the city, but it's enough to get the water up to the fourth, fifth or sixth story in every building throughout the city. So when you walk through some of the older residential neighborhoods in New York City, whether that's Manhattan, Brooklyn, you'll notice that the oldest residential neighborhood, uh, residential buildings tend to be the four, five or six story walk-ups. They were built that height because that's how high the water could get into those buildings before we had invented electric pumps that could pump it to a rooftop tower and then allow gravity to take back over from there. So important to understand that New York City's water supply system is not actually one system, it's three. Uh, so the three systems are the Croton system, that's circled in green down here on the right. First activated 1842, uh, consists of 12 reservoirs and three lakes. That is the filtered part of our water supply that goes through the Croton filtration plant in the Bronx and typically accounts for about 10% of New York City's water on a typical day. Uh, after the city grew uh, by about tenfold between 1842 and 1900 from a population of about 300,000 to 3 million, uh, the city was quickly running out of water and decided to go to the Catskills to build the next part of its water supply, specifically the Eastern Catskills. That, part, that system, we call it the Catskill system, was built between 1907 and 1927. Activated December 27, 1915, uh, it consists of three reservoirs. It's part of our unfiltered water supply system and accounts for about 40% of New York City's drinking water on a typical day. I must can't, can't go without saying uh, that water comes to the city through the Catskill Aqueduct, which I'll talk about in a minute. It includes the deepest part of any part of New York City's water supply where that aqueduct goes under the Hudson River 
uh, just uh, just north of West Point is 1,114 feet deep uh, below the river, which is the deepest part of our water supply. Then again, the city grows, needs more water and goes to the headwaters of the Delaware River where they built what we call our Delaware system. First activated in 1944, actually in an emergency because the city needed additional water supply to support efforts related to World War II. Uh, consists of five reservoirs, again, part of our unfiltered supply and typically accounts for about 50% of the water coming into New York City. So Croton about 10%, Catskill 40, Delaware 50. That's usually the split of water coming into the city. I just wanna highlight some of the things that we're up to, right? So operating this water supply is a big, big uh, job. Uh, suffice to say, we have lots of stuff, right? We have to manage the delivery and treatment of more than a billion gallons a day, but we're also responsible for the maintenance of a lot of infrastructure that includes more than 280 water supply facilities, uh, water supply reservoirs and lakes themselves, treatment facilities for chlorine, ultraviolet disinfection, fluoridation, and the Croton filtration plant. Uh, 36 shafts that plunge hundreds of feet deep into the earth and connect to our aqueducts, almost 400 miles of large aqueducts. And when I say large, they're big enough, big enough that you could drive a train through them. They're, they are very, very big. They range anywhere from about 13 and a half to 22 feet in diameter. Uh, 29 water supply dams. You can see the dam here on the top is Gilboa Dam. Uh, those workers are tied into a safety line and they're doing one of my favorite spring maintenance items, which is cleaning the driftwood off the top of the dam. Uh, we own 57 bridges and 99 miles of road north of the city. Uh, we operate seven wastewater treatment facilities outside the city. And of course, we have to operate all this stuff. You can see the bottom right there. That's our 24 hour water supply control center where they are monitoring the water supply and operating it around the clock. Uh, with all sorts of telemetric devices that give us real-time data. Water quality, which is what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, we have the most robust complex water quality program of any city in the world. And I can tell you that because we get a lot of international visitors who want to come, who come visit our water supply and want to replicate some of the programs that we have, especially to protect the water at its source. And when I tell them we test New York City's water more than two and a half million times a year, uh, sometimes people have me uh, say that a couple times so the translator can translate it. They think it's an error in translation, but no, we actually do test New York City's water more than two and a half million times a year. Those tests sort of fit into two different buckets. Uh, one bucket is the work that's done by our scientists and our four water quality laboratories. So they're out collecting about 53,000 samples per year, give or take by hand. Those samples are collected from the streams, creeks, and rivers that feed our reservoirs, from the reservoirs themselves, from the aqueducts, from the treatment facilities, and from the entry points uh, into the city, and also from about 1,000 street side sampling stations in the city that are plumbed directly into the water mains, and each station represents about the same amount of population citywide. They take those samples back to our labs, and those are tested about 654,000 times, uh, 654,000 different analyses are performed on them. And you can see we analyze for about 240 different parameters, simple things like temperature and pH and really complex stuff like some of the pathogens and microbiological parameters that we, that we test for. That's one bucket of water quality tests. The other bucket has to do with the uh, device that uh, my friend Paul Perry is working on there in the top right-hand corner. That's one of our uh, 18 robotic monitoring stations. Uh, there is a device on the underside of that buoy that goes up and down throughout the full depth of the water all day long and sends us real-time data about the quality of the water through the full depth of each reservoir because there's an immense amount of flexibility in New York City's reservoir system. So not only can we choose which system we're drawing water from, which reservoir in each system we're drawing water from, but also what depth in each reservoir uh, in each system we're drawing water from. And to take full advantage of that flexibility, you have to have loads and loads of data on which to make your operational decisions. So uh, water quality is a, a big part of what we do. So let's talk about some of the work we've been doing lately. We are in a um, uh, sort of in a time in the history of New York City's water supply where we are uh, rehabilitating a lot of the infrastructure that gets the water from here in the mountains where I am into the city where you are. 
and in particular, we are uh, spending a lot of time rehabilitating our two major aqueducts, the Catskill Aqueduct and the Delaware Aqueduct. Uh, this year, in the fall, uh, November through February uh, and winter, we uh, worked on year three of a very big project to rehabilitate our Catskill Aqueduct. The Catskill Aqueduct is the most complex water conveyance structure in the United States. It's 92 miles long, 55, mi 55 and a half miles of it is actually above ground. Portions of it, as I mentioned, plunge deep below the Hudson River. Uh, it is a very, very complex uh, aqueduct. As I said, it first delivered water into the Bronx, sorry, December 17th, 1915. And in order to do this project, we have to shut down the Catskill Aqueduct for 10 weeks at a time in the fall of each year. It started with fall of 2018-19, then 1920, and then 2021 this past year. And the work here really consists of three things. It consists of cleaning the inside of the aqueduct, repairing some leaks uh, in the aqueduct lining, and replacing century-old valves, about 33 century-old valves that are connected to the aqueduct. This year, the work included something really unique, which was at two of our locations, we actually had to do saturation dives to remove and replace some leaking valves. A saturation dive is when uh, a worker has to uh, essentially live in a pressurized environment for weeks at a time and dive in a diving bell down. In this case, it was about 450, 500 feet deep into the water. Then they swim out of the diving bell because their body is now acclimated to the pressure of all that hundreds of feet, hundreds of feet of water that's going to be on top of them. And then at the end of their shift, they go back into the bell and they live in a pressurized environment in a trailer. And there's a special lock where food is dished out to them and all sorts of things. So we had uh, two locations, uh, very skilled workers doing saturation dives for about, I think it was about five or six weeks. Um, all of this work is happening 12 hours a day, in some cases, 24 hours a day, seven days a week from November through February. And the goal of this is, right, the Catskill Aqueduct has been serving the city for, you know, 106 years. We want to make sure that it can continue to do that. We also uh, know that over the years, its capacity has declined because uh, there was some biofilm growing on the inside of the tunnel, which is a harmless bacteria that ha that's filamentous. And it creates this almost surface of the moon type uh, surface in the inside the aqueduct. It creates friction. If there's friction in the aqueduct, the water moves slower. If it moves slower, we can't deliver as much of it each day. So this project is going to restore about 35 to 40 million gallons per day of our historic carrying capacity. And when we we're working on that project, we had to reconfigure the water supply system. Again, usually the Delaware system would provide 70, would provide 50 percent of the water. Catskill would provide 40, Croton would provide 10. This year, Delaware was providing 75% and Croton was providing 25%. We are working on that Catskill Aqueduct project because we need the Catskill Aqueduct to be chugging at its full capacity to complete an even more complex repair that we're working on on the Delaware Aqueduct, where you may have read in some news stories that have come out over the years that we're building a bypass tunnel under the Hudson River to move water around a very uh, large leaking section of the Delaware Aqueduct. This is the largest repair in the 179 year history of the New York City water supply system. It involves building a 2.5 mile long tunnel under the Hudson River. That tunnel is now finished. Uh, it was finished being drilled in 2019. We finished lining it with steel early last year. And just recently we finished the finished concrete liner in that steel uh, within the past month. Uh, it's on target uh, for a six month long shutdown of the Delaware Aqueduct that will happen starting in the fall of 2022. And when that shutdown happens, again, New York City's water is gonna be coming from different places. Instead of 50, 40, 10, we're gonna be relying on 60% of the water coming through the Catskill Aqueduct and 40% of the water coming from the Croton system. And now here, just to show you, this is a schematic on the bottom left. Please excuse, and there was some artistic license taken here. It's not leaking for that entire stretch. It's actually leaking 
just in one area that's on near the western shore of the Hudson River, leaking about 15 to 16 million gallons a day. So what we did is we built, represented in yellow here, a brand new tunnel directly alongside the existing tunnel while the existing tunnel is in operation. We're gonna build it to about 50 feet away from the existing tunnel. Once it's done, we're gonna shut down the existing tunnel, connect, connect the new bypass to structurally sound portions of the existing Delaware Aqueduct, plug the leaking section in place and take that leaking section out of service forever. This is like the biggest bypass surgery that's ever happened on earth, if you want to think of it that way. Um, you can see here on the right, some of this big steel liners, uh, about uh, uh, 9,200 linear feet of steel that was installed in this tunnel, 600 feet below the Hudson River to give it structural stability. On the top left there, that's some of our workers, including Commissioner Sapienza, uh, taking a picture with the last steel liner to go down uh, last year. So all of this work is going on. We also have a lot of work upcoming. I mentioned the Catskill Aqueduct Rehabilitation, Delaware Aqueduct re uh, Bypass Tunnel. We have some other work to, ha to happen on the lower Catskill Aqueduct. Right now we're working on the northernmost 74 miles. We're gonna be working on the southern uh, 18 miles coming up in the mid 2020s. We have some work on the pressure tunnels of the Catskill Aqueduct that help the Catskill Aqueduct plunge deep below rivers and creeks. Uh, we have some uh, a new tunneling project in Westchester County that's going to be happening in the 2020s and 30s. And we have some projects at Hillview Reservoir, all of which are going to require us to get creative and use the full flexibility of New York City's water supply system. Now, the system that comes to help most often when we need it, either it's in droughts or when we're doing infrastructure projects, is the Croton system, the old dependable Croton system. As I say, it typically accounts for about 10% of New York City's water supply, about 80 to 120 million gallons a day. That water is drawn, drawn from New Croton Reservoir in Westchester County, and it's delivered to the Bronx via the New Croton Aqueduct, where it goes through the filtration plan. Um, typically, uh, while typically that's, as I said, delivered by gravity alone, about 80 to 120 million gallons a day. Well, when we shut down the Catskill system this, this fall for repair and the previous falls, we had to rely on more water from the Croton system. So instead of 80 to 120, we were using 180 to 250 million gallons a day of Croton system. Right now we're using about 80 million gallons a day, but that's gonna actually increase starting tomorrow um, to help uh, support some quality issues that we're having in our Catskill system right now. I'll show you that at the end of, as a result of a big snow melt we had on Christmas day. Um, typically, right, that water goes to the low service area when it's just the 80 to 120. When we're using 180 to 250, the filtration plant pumps it into what's called the high service area. So I'm gonna break this down for you in a minute, but right now the low service area is getting 100% Croton water. So when I say low service, that means low elevation areas of the Bronx and Manhattan. When we have to use more than 80 to 120, we actually have to pump that water up into the high service area that's usually fed by the Catskill system. Well, what's the difference? The difference is that the Catskill system and the Delaware system are actually about 150 feet higher in terms of their distribution than the, than the Croton system is. So when we want to increase the production of Croton water, we actually have to pump against that head pressure to get more of that water into the distribution system, usually through tunnels number, tunnel three, and then in addition through tunnel number one. Uh, Croton water has been in use this year since October 27th. Uh, and we do intend on continuing to use water from the Croton system for the foreseeable future. So let's talk about the taste and odor uh, complaints that we, uh, that we uh, heard about and that we continue to hear about in much smaller numbers. But when we first turned on the Croton system, uh, we had zero taste and odor complaints for the first month, really October through November. We began to get some calls right around the end of November uh, and these calls were saying things that we had heard the year prior, which was that the earth, that the, um, excuse me, that the water had a musty or earthy smell or taste to it. The timing of those calls starting is coincident with the fall die off of aquatic plants in the reservoirs across the entire system. When these calls began to ramp up, 
it reached about 15 to 25 calls per day at their peak. And when I say calls, I'm talking about 311 calls. Our scientists were out doing testing at the, um, at the street side sampling stations. And in some locations, they also were noticing it. That call up has come down to about zero to five complaints a day, which is where we're at now. And we began doing very intensive sampling of the raw water from the reservoir, the treated water that was coming out of the filtration plant and the sampling stations throughout the city. We put out some messaging on social media and through robocalls, and we absolutely knew what was going on. And uh, I'm gonna share that with you now. So it's not unusual historically that the city would get 311 calls or complaint calls uh, when it activates the Croton system. Even dating back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s, whenever DEP would start up the Croton system or increase the amount of Croton water going into the system, we would get complaint calls or, or concern calls for a week. The reason is the Croton water and the Catskills water are very different from each other. Uh, they are different because the underlying geology in the areas that surround the reservoirs in each system are very different. And our reservoirs are just like any other lake. They are subject to natural processes. They're subject to the watersheds that surround them. And so in the Croton system, you have different minerals. You have a different hardness of the water. There were some historically some issues with manganese that the filtration plant has solved. And this would cause a different taste. Now, the interesting thing is that some people actually preferred the taste of Croton water to Catskill water. We actually did an in-house taste test around the time I started here at DEP, and 38% of people preferred Croton water. Um, it's mineral water. People pay good money for mineral water because certain people like the taste, and, and that's really what it is. There's a lot more calcium and manganese in the Croton water than there is in the Catskill water. In fact, the Catskill water is uniquely soft. It is some of the softest water on the planet. So Practically, as I say, we got zero calls. The interesting thing about this is when we began to ramp up the Croton system this year, we began to notice that we were getting zero calls from the low service area. So in this map, the low service area is shaded gray in Manhattan and the Bronx. That's the low service area. Those are just lower elevation portions of those two bureau, bureau, boroughs. We were getting zero calls from those areas those areas were receiving 100% Croton water. The vast majority of our calls were coming through the Tunnel 3 distribution area, which is highlighted in green in Manhattan and the Bronx uh, and in Brooklyn. What we began to understand is that the way the filtration plant works is that when the demand for water is high, the filtration plant really ramps up production and begins to pump more Croton water into that high service area to essentially get that water out into the distribution system while people are using water. So as you know, water use follows a very diurnal pattern in New York City. When people wake up in the morning and begin brushing and showering and flushing and using water all the ways you use it, the water use begins to increase, 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 then people go to work and it decreases a little bit and stays steady throughout the day. They come home for dinner and all their nighttime activities, it goes up again. And then around eight o'clock, nine o'clock, it begins to go down sharply until the next morning when people are waking up and preparing for their day again. What this meant in Tunnel 3, in the Tunnel 3 distribution area, because the pressure in the system is different in these service areas, and because of that diurnal pattern in use, people were literally getting water from two different systems in 12 hour patterns. So in the morning, they may have been getting Croton water, but by evening, they were getting water from the Catskills. And it seemed that this made it much easier for many people to detect the difference in the taste and the difference in the odor. It's important to understand, right, your community board is in one of these zones that was flipping in these 12 hour patterns while we were pumping into the high service area. The frequency of that change, you know, really makes the, the, the taste in uh, 
the di difference in taste easier to detect. Now, what is causing this difference in taste? In the fall, right, as I said, the reservoirs are like any other lake. They are subject to natural processes that happen just like in every other lake. Aquatic organisms die off in the fall, and when they die off, some of them give off these teeny, teeny, tiny organic compounds that essentially become part of the water. The two biggest culprits that we're interested in are called MIB and geosmin. These two organic compounds are found in soil across the globe. And in fact, these compounds are the same compounds that give beets and corn their earthy flavor. If you ever go out to the country and you get a big rainstorm in the, in the fall and you can smell that smell from the rain, that's actually the rain releasing geosmin and MIB from the rotting leaves. That's that smell of rain that we all love in the country. It's these compounds that actually get into the water. Now, these compounds are 100% harmless to human health. As I said, we eat them in, in common vegetables every day. The tricky thing is they are... Uh, detectable in water at very, very, very low levels. In fact, ultra sensitive people can detect them as low as five parts per trillion. And many people can detect them at 15 parts per trillion. Now, what's a part per trillion? A part per trillion, for instance, is one pinch of salt on more than 10 tons of potato chips or a single drop of water in 20 Olympic swimming pools. We are talking about teeny, teeny, tiny amounts. Okay, I got some, so I'll get to this in a minute. I'll, I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent, but water at New Croton Reservoir in the, in the winter, the raw water had about 40 to 60 parts per trillion of these organic compounds in it. After the water went through the filtration plant, the water had about 10 to 15 parts per trillion in it. Now, as you can see, we're hovering right around that detection limit where people can actually begin to smell it and taste it. And in fact, I had two people call me, residents of the Lower East Side, this week to ask about this. And the thing I found interesting was both of them asked the same question. How come I can taste it, but some of my neighbors in my same exact building cannot? And I passed that along to our water quality scientists who are researching this because it's very, very interesting how these compounds can be detected by different people differently. This is a global challenge. You will not go to any continent on the globe and not find a city or a small town community water supply that is dealing with this issue. From Canada to the United States to the UK, down on the bottom here is the uh, National Water Supply for Wales in the UK. Practically every place across the globe deals with this in some way, shape, or form. So, what can we do about it? This is what we're trying to understand because traditionally New York City's water supply, even the Chrome system did not have this issue. So what we did is we installed some new filter medium in the Chrome filtration plant last year. That is helping us a little bit. Uh, we expect there to be some biologic growth on that medium that will help gobble up this MIB and geosmin. And we think we'll get to somewhere in around 90% removal. But to be clear, these organic compounds are not typically capable of being filtered out. That's why I have people call me and say, hey, I poured this through a Brita. It did nothing. It won't do anything. It's not particulate, okay? It's in the water. It's part of the water. You cannot filter it out. We're going to be installing a uh, new treatment system at, Croton, uh, at New Croton Reservoir for chlorine dioxide. It's a pretreatment system that we used to use in other parts of the water supply. And we expect, again, that this is going to help. Um, we, uh, I don't want to get ahead of the science here, but um, we have a suspicion that one of the things that might be contributing is that New Croton Reservoir, we have a very nasty invasive species that has uh, gotten into the reservoir about five years ago. It's called hydrilla. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it is a aquatic plant uh, from Asia that's very popular in aquariums. Somehow it got into New Croton Reservoir, and it now covers about 35% of the reservoir. And the tricky thing about hydrilla is it is one of the few plants in the world that acts as a phosphorus pump. Now, what does that mean? 
our world-renowned programs to protect New York City's water at its source focus largely on keeping nutrients out of our water. One of the nutrients or the top nutrient that we try to keep out of the water is phosphorus because it can lead to taste and odor issues. Hydrilla take phosphorus from the soil under the water and pump it up into the water, okay? This allows all sorts of things to grow more easily, not to mention that the hydrilla itself is a huge biomass that is growing in the reservoir that was not there before. We are embarking on a very complex project starting this summer to begin to remove the hydrilla from New Crota Reservoir that was planned, that's been planned for years now. We have moved this. Uh, one of the things you may not realize is that DDP, we have a very big scientific research uh, department on the water supply. And we have essentially moved this to the top of our research agenda. We are in a partnership now with Cardiff University in Wales, where they have a scientist who is considered the worldwide leader in understanding these particular compounds that cause these taste and odor issues. And in fact, just last month, we sent off some samples for him to do uh, some advanced analyses in his laboratory. We're partnering with the Water Research Foundation uh, to do some research projects in our water supply to understand the source, uh, the source and the fate of these compounds and how to how to manage them more, um, more effectively. Uh, we have a salinity task force. I'll just mention this because we think there is, uh, there is some indication in the literature that there may be a connection between uh, solid, the salinity of water and uh, the ability for these compounds to be more plentiful. And we actually even dug up something that I think you may find interesting. When they went to design the chrono filtration plant, they actually bought a whole bunch of miniature filtration parts of different filtration processes and tested them out. Well, we kept them all. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna test a bunch of different methods on the mini filtration plant in a closed loop and see what else we can do in a controlled environment to help remove these taste and odor compounds that are so pesky. Other important facts, We've received and validated some equipment recently in December to monitor in-house for these taste and odor compounds. One of the things that was really nagging our scientists is that this is one of the few things we didn't have the ability to test for in our own lab. So we would have to send out samples to a contract laboratory and there was a lot of lag time involved. We wanna be able to do that testing all the time in real time. Uh, currently we're seeing the MIB and geosmin levels really come down as the winter ends. And there is some connection here that when growing season starts, these compounds disappear because they're being taken up by the aquatic organ by the aquatic organisms that are growing. Um, some, as I mentioned, some are noticing the difference in taste, but not all. Uh, current filtration plant continues to work great, right? Uh, we have excellent removal of solids there, excellent removal of manganese, which is what it was really designed to do, and the turbidity, right? The clarity of the water coming out of the plant is awesome, so the Clarity of our Catskill Delaware water is 0 0.8 NTU, nephilometric turbidity units, which is crystal clear. But the Crone filtration plant is producing water that's 0 .0, 0 0.02 NTU, which is like the clearest water on earth. Um, and it's worth noting that these sorts of issues have pestered even our Catskill system uh, as recently as 2010, when we had something called crisis forella in the system that was giving it a strange metallic taste for about a month. You know, something I'm very conscious about is not stigmatizing the Croton system because it is very, very important. Of course, the history of the Croton system is that it was activated in 1842 and really saved the city from an, uh, an unrelenting pattern of fires and disease and filth that were essentially killing the city. Um, and uh, it was really the original marvel of modern engineering, right? Gravity fed. It dropped 13 and a quarter inches per mile to maintain the gravity feed all the way to New York City. At the time, New Croton Dam was the largest dam in the world when it was completed in 1905 and made that a larger reservoir from the small dam that first impounded it in 1842. As I mentioned, it allowed the city to grow from 200,000 people to about 3.5 million in only 73 years, right? Historians talk about the two great waterworks that turned New York into the Empire State those being the uh, Erie Canal and the Croton system. Uh, it's one of the two big pieces of infrastructure. I, I just mentioned that. Uh, Croton system has the capacity and flexibility to save New York City from droughts, and it did so as recently as 2016. 
If we did not have the Crohn system, we would have been in a declared drought in 2016. Uh, Crohn system has the capacity and flexibility to really allow us to get these necessary infrastructure projects done that would otherwise be impossible to do. And in 2018, we won the New York State uh, drinking water taste test with Croton water. So it is a great system. I just want to mention one other thing because while I'm on, I figured I'd <clears throat> give something for people to talk about, right? We're in snow melt season right now. So one of the things that DEP does better than any water supply in the world is monitor snowpack and snow melt. Uh, snow is very, very important to us and important to you as consumers of our water. Um, the reservoir system gets about 400 billion gallons of runoff uh, between November and May of each year. And about 10, somewhere between 10 and 50% of that comes from melting snow, depending on the year. We have water supply staff that actually go out <clears throat> every two weeks into the water supply, into the, into the watershed, and they measure how much water is trapped in the snow. Now, it used to be they would do this by plunging a big plastic pipe into the snow and then weighing it, and that would tell them how much water was trapped in the snow. Then in the top right, we moved to a system called snow pillows that would actually measure the weight of the snow and use an algorithm to tell us how much water was trapped in there. And then more recently, one of our scientists invented this little contraption on the bottom right, which has an interesting story. It's actually in that little Grinch green box is a radio chip that sends about 2 billion radio waves per second at a little plate on the ground. You can see Glenn standing on that plate, and we know the exact distance between the chip and that plate. As the snow piles up on the ground, the rate at which those radio waves return back to the chip will slow down based on the density of the snow. We can then use an algorithm to say, based on the return rate of those wavelengths of different frequency, how much water is trapped in the snow based on its density. Our scientists invented it. That radio chip had never been used for this before. It was actually used to monitor the respiration rate of prematurely born babies because the rising and falling of a prematurely born baby's chest is a very, very teeny tiny difference in distance over time. We just adapted that technology to measure snow very, very carefully. And why do we do that? Because melting snow has consequences. This top left picture is the day before Christmas this year. The bottom left picture is the same exact location 48 hours later. When the snow melts all at once, it can be very disastrous. And on the right is a photo of one of the roads that runs through the Catskills, and it can get the creeks, rivers, and streams running so fast that they actually destroy things, right? Now, this Adam, was a, Adam, yeah. ex excuse me, it's Alice, I'm afraid. Yep. We're, uh, I'm I, done. this has been absolutely fascinating, um, but I'm afraid we're going to have to Good. open it up to questions and answers because uh, we've got a big agenda. I'm so sorry. It's no absolutely problem. extraordinary. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm we get everybody here who's on the agenda heard from. I'm finished. I just figured I'd show you that we have 86 billion gallons of water in the snow right now. So rest well. We won't have a drought. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. This is absolutely fascinating. I cannot thank you enough. My um, pleasure. Uh, let me open it up to see if there are any questions. We have a few minutes left. Anybody from um, the community board or the community at large? Diana, do you see any hands up? It was quite comprehensive. You certainly answered the question as to <laughs> what, what's going on with the taste of the water. Um, really interesting um, that people, some people taste it, some don't. I can speak personally in my own family. That's exactly what took place. Um, anyway, I really, it's, I think it's the first time our community board has heard from you all, and I just hope you'll make other visits, and I, I cannot thank you enough. Again, it's really, I hope everyone else found it as interesting. Can I echo that? That Adam, you can come back anytime. Yes. That was riveting. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's I do have a few questions here. I do see, I, okay. wait a minute, I, so let me quickly get to those. And um, I see Richard Corman waving his hand there. Richard. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, this was really fascinating. Um, but I wanted to ask if, and I appreciate it very much. I wanted to ask if you could talk a moment more about the hydrilla 
Yeah. Uh, a cousin of mine is uh, actually on the water board at Croton on Hudson. And over these last few years, he's been telling me what a horrible problem it's been there. And yeah. an awfully invasive species and the dilemma they've been facing on how to deal with it. Yeah. So, so, so our dilemmas are connected, but they're different. So in the reservoir, it's a problem for all the reasons that I just mentioned. It, it causes dense mats in the reservoir that are hard for like fishermen to boat through, but it also acts as a phosphorus pump and all the problems that I mentioned. For Croton on Hudson, the bigger issue they had was that when it, when it came out of the reservoir and over the dam, Hydrilla can replicate. You don't have to replant its roots or anything. Just the teeniest fragment of a leaf can propagate a brand new plant. And so one of the things that makes this plant so terrible is it replicates so easily. It makes it very hard to get rid of. So down in Croton on Hudson, they have some recreation areas on the Croton River that were completely choked out by hydrilla. I mean, the river was just completely covered by it. And so they had to go through a process of removing the hydrilla from the river. Similar process we have to go through, but for two very different reasons. Ours is to protect the potable water supply for the city of New York, and theirs was because some of their key recreation areas were just completely overwhelmed by it and nobody could use the river anymore. And uh, just quickly, they were considering, and I don't know if they did do this or not, I think they might have, using a, an herbicide yeah. to kill it. Now, wouldn't that affect the, couldn't that affect the drinking water? No, so here's why. It's something called fluoridone, okay? And fluoridone has been used in drinking water supplies in California, and actually drinking water supplies in New York. Uh, in fact, the um, Cayuga Lake, which is the water source for Ithaca, had the same issue and they use fluoridone. Fluoridone is photosensitive. So here's the deal. When we treat this water with fluoridone, it's gonna go through our big UV units. We treat the water with ultraviolet light and the ultraviolet light, there's not gonna be any of it left because it's gonna be uptaken by the plants. We, we actually know this, we've tested it already. But even if there was any left, the high intensity ultraviolet lights would disintegrate it and it, it wouldn't be there anymore. So we have high degree of confidence. We actually impaneled an expert panel of biologists and chemists from across the country to look at our treatment plans for getting rid of the hydrilla and had them do a peer review of it before we uh, went forward with it, just to make sure it was going to be for the safety and efficacy of it. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a great question. Um, yeah, great question. Um, um, Michael Frankauer, I see your hand. Sorry, up. actually, that was, I had the exact same question, but just want to echo what you and Wendy said. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. Thanks so much for coming and talking to us, Adam. Thank you. And I, you know, one thing I just want to reiterate very quickly is, um, is we know that it's not pleasant. And as, as the previous presenter said, sometimes the scientific process takes a little time to catch up with the solution to the problem. Um, we know what the cause is and we know it's 100% harmless unless you don't want to eat beets and corn anymore. I mean, it's, it's the same exact thing. Uh, we know it's unpleasant and, you know, our job at DEP is not only to provide water that's safe, but we want to provide water that's like that's amb that has ambient qualities that are good too that are that's good tasting. So um, we have really put this at the top of the priority list as an issue that we want to solve as quickly as possible, and we're bringing all the science to bear that we possibly can to do that. Well, again, many many thanks, Adam. It's really fascinating. I, I'm very happy, and I think a lot of people are happy to hear that 100% healthful <laughs> note on all fronts. Um, that's great. And we look forward to having this be the beginning of a relationship with the community <laughs> board. Um, and again, many thanks to you and to your colleague over there, Rachel, um, different department. Um, and uh, if you could send us the presentation, that would be great. And sure. we'll, we, we again, many, many thanks. Great. I hope you and your family stay well. <laughs> Thank you. You too. All right. Um, well, that was really fascinating. Uh, the Hudson River and uh, water quality and reservoir water quality review. So thanks to all again. So uh, let's hope that the battery has no hy pesky hydrilla. So we're going to go on to um, hearing. I think uh, Will Fisher from EDC is here, and among a, a lot of other folks, who is going to talk about the new battery wharf resiliency plans. Um, and also with us tonight. Oh, 
along with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation representatives will be um, Rory Price from the Battery Conservancy, as well as Nick Spordone and I think Gwen Dawson from the Battery Park City Authority, who uh, we're going to try to sort of tie in both the, the work that's being done on the wharf and the battery, as well as the entrance to the battery, the new resiliency plans that is, and the tie in with Pier A. So that um, all happens tonight. Okay, without further ado, Will, thank you very much for your patience and. Uh... My pleasure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Will Fisher here with the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Fun fact, I used to be a DEP employee um, and I've also toured the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment facility and this stuff really interests me. So didn't know I was gonna learn all that, but I loved it. Thank you for uh, that was entertaining. And Adam is a fantastic speaker. Um, so anyway, a uh, lot of uh, team here. So I'm going to uh, go through and introduce a few folks, but um, Alice, thank you for hosting us. Like you said, we are here to present on the Battery Wharf Project, which is a component of Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency, um, which is the sort of umbrella project that uh, includes multiple sub projects stretching from Battery Park City uh, all the way up to two bridges and uh, the East side, uh, East side Coastal Resiliency Project. So uh, from EDC's team, um, again, I'm Will Fisher with Government and Community Relations. I'm also joined here by Jennifer Cass and Joanna Gargiula from the EDC Capital Program. Um, we also have with us tonight, Jordan Salinger from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Um, and then also pleased to introduce my colleagues at the Parks Department. Um, Parks is of course the um, owner and operator and we are um, working this project on behalf of them. Uh, Grace Tang and Michael Bradley are here from the Parks Department. Um, we are <clears throat> also joined tonight by Stantec. Um, and I think one thing that is um, really exciting about this is that we've talked to the community board for, I suppose it's been almost two years about this project, but um, we have not had the overlapping situation of one, having a design firm on a design engineering firm on board and not being in the middle of a pandemic caused fiscal crisis. So. Now that we are here, um, the uh, this was like I mentioned earlier. Um, this was the last of the LNCR portfolio to come off of um, sort of hold with the city. Uh, so we were reauthorized by OMB and City Hall to proceed with work on this very important project in December of last year. Um, we have Stantec on board as the design and engineering consultant. Um, they've got a great team here tonight with April, Amy, Greg, and maybe some others. Um, so generally what we're going to be doing this evening is for the first time getting into detail on this project. So what is the project scope? What are sort of some concepts and what are some things that we're considering in regard to design of the new wharf on the um, at Battery Park? So we sort of have the confluence here of two um, big uh, you know, reasons to move forward with this project. Number one, the, the wharf is just overall in pretty bad shape. Uh, we need to replace it and do some very extensive repairs anyway. Um, and number two is obviously dealing with the threat of climate change and thinking about lower Manhattan holistically within the LMCR portfolio. So while we already need to rebuild the battery wharf, we're going to be rebuilding it um, at, a, at an appropriate height to mitigate against sea level rise um, and protect the park, which we all know is a um, historic treasure for the city and you know, want to make sure that it remains usable and um, beneficial to the public off into the future. So um, with that, I'd love to invite really quick um, in case my park, my colleagues at parks would like to say anything, and then I will turn it over to April and her team uh, to go through the presentations, which we have. So really quick before park speaks, um, Stantec folks, would you mind just letting um, Diana and I know who is going to be sharing the slides so that she can give you yeah. the permission to do so? Well, this is Greg, I'll be, I'll be sharing and I do have permission. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Grace or Michael, any any other uh, thoughts on the introduction? Uh, hi, this is Grace um, from Parks. I can just say a couple words just that, um, yeah, we're excited to be here to introduce the project to you. We're also joined by um, Hope Cohen and Rory Price from the Conservancy. I think I saw them on the invite list. They, of course, um, you know, take care of the park. So, you know, we operate in, in in conjunction with them. So, um, but I'll just turn it over to Stantec and let them take it away. Great, very good. All right.
hopefully that coming through okay yep we can see it thanks greg perfect okay thank you well thank you grace um well, yeah we are excited to be here and to introduce the battery resiliency project to everyone tonight um i am my name is greg spritch i'm the project manager for Stantec, and i am joined with amy seek and april schneider for our presentation um, as Will said, the battery project fits into the broader context of the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Initiative. I'm sure many in this meeting are familiar with this graphic and how these series of projects share the common goal of protecting down Manhattan. And um, our project specifically is limited to Batteries Park um, and spans about a third of the mile along the park's waterfront frontage. Um, we are coordinating with the adjacent projects um, to the to our east and west um, Battery Park City Authority South Resiliency Project and the Financial District um, and Seaport Master Plan. This is a um, image of our project location. Um, and our project location is primarily limited to the reconstruction of the wharf itself. Um, and as you can see with the boundary line, it's an objective to keep our project footprint as narrow as possible um, and minimize any disturbance to the park's amenities, monuments, historical features, and trees. And it's an unfortunate reality that the existing wharf is in very poor condition. Um, this graphic illustrates a summary of the deterioration that is occurring along the length of the wharf. Um, several areas of the wharf are in critical condition and now close to the public, most notably the large portion of the Esplanade northwest of the National Park Security Tent that's been closed for some time. And due to some worsening deterioration, areas to the southeast of the tent have also now been recently closed. Um, these are just a few photos of the representing the port, the, the worst condition. Um, it encompasses the top side, the waterfront facing frontage um, and the underwater portions. Um, there are several areas exhibiting erosion loss and sinkholes. The fascia is crumbling um, and in some locations missing. Um, and most significantly, um, and most significantly, the supporting piles are experiencing substantial section, section loss. So we must address this. Um, the wharf must be reconstructed. Um, in doing so, the project is considering climate change impacts and proposing to raise the wharf to a higher elevation um, and thus protecting the park from sea level rise impacts and future, future flood inundation. So in order to understand the 80 year design life of a structure like this, we're looking at climate change impacts through 2100. And you can see here, there are many potential futures. Um, the New York panel on climate change has elucidated four potential sea level rise projections through 2100 based on different carbon emission scenarios. So the most likely scenario shown on this chart is the 10th percentile scenario. Uh, that means there's a 90% chance that the sea level will rise by the amount shown in this light pink line. And the least likely but the highest risk scenario is the 90th percentile. Uh, this projects about nine or sorry, about 6.3 feet of sea level rise. So our aim is to understand the implications for design across this range of potential futures. So the implications of doing nothing are more clearly shown in the following series of slides, uh, which show the 90th percentile sea level rise projection. Uh, and what it looks like across time at the Battery Wharf if it remains at its current oh. elevation. So presently, um, the wharf, the mean, mean higher high water sits roughly three feet, seven inches below the top of the wharf. By 2050, if the wharf were to remain at an elevation of plus six, um, that would reach just a foot below the top. And by 2080, there's a chance that we'll see inundation of up to a foot every day. And by 2100, that inundation reaches nearly 2.5 feet every single day. So our design criteria is informed by uh, the sea level rise projections over the next 80 years, but we also um, considered waves generated in the from the wake of boats in the harbor. So what you see here is how we arrived at the design elevation of plus 11 that we'll be raising the wharf to. 
Um, it starts with mean high or high water in the present day scenario of 2.28. We add 6.3 feet of sea level rise to that uh, figure. And then uh, roughly 1.3 feet of waves generated by vessels in the harbor. We added another foot or so of freeboard um, as an added factor of safety. And you can see in this graphic how the design is different from the other LMCR projects going on, um, but it interacts with and connects with them to form an integrated set of resilience projects. So our design elevation, as I mentioned, is plus 11, it protects from 2100 sea level rise, uh, while the projects east and west of our um, project protect from a 100 year storm surge in 2050. So that pushes the design elevation of those projects up to over 18 feet higher than what we're dealing with. So looking at how these projects interact in section, you can see that the wharf raised to plus 11 at the right side of the screen and the higher berm protection in the back of the park for storm surge. The plus 11 design elevation must balance protection from climate change impacts for high risk assets um, with the preservation of the park character and its relationship to the water. So you'll see in um, following parts of the presentation how going higher than plus 11 would really impact views to the water and the upland connection of the wharf to the park. And another impact is in maintaining access to the many boats that use the wharf in the near term, even as the wharf is raised. So you can see here that raising the wharf five feet creates uh, challenges for boarding when the boat is still at present day levels. And to address this, um, while avoiding building structures out into the water to get down to the boats, we've developed this slip concept uh, that gradually brings passengers down to two different elevations. Uh, this is designed to allow boat access both now and in the future. So the slip configuration improves accessibility um, both in the near term by providing options for different tidal conditions where today there is only one, and in the long term as well, um, the flexibility for long term scenarios. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the um, the elements of the site that we're taking into consideration as we're developing this design. Access to the wharf happens through the park on major and minor circulation routes through the BOSC. There are stairs and ramps at um, stairs and ramps and then at grade entrances to the wharf along the entire frontage. Um, the wharf, especially along the western side, is largely occupied by queues getting on boats and um, the National Park Service security tent occupies the wharf frontage in front of Castle Clinton. Then looking in more detail at the site, uh, much of the wharf has these consistent elements. Um, the wharf sits generally two and a half feet below the adjacent park grade and various circulation flows happen in parallel along the wharf. So starting at the front of the wharf, vessel access and queuing occurs along the face of the wharf for a lot of the frontage. Um, and then passage along the wharf promenade is broad and generous. Um, next, there's the Gardens of Remembrance, which sits two and a half feet higher. Um, those sit at the, the high point um, of the wharf and they have the views of the water. Um, there's a path for the Gardens of Remembrance that's pretty continuous and very narrow um, with seating along the sides. And then the Bosque Path sits behind the Gardens of Remembrance along a row of existing mature plane trees. And then major paths lead through the Bosque downstairs or ramps to the wharf. Um, there is a good amount of seating on the wharf. There are backless benches. Um, there is a long granite seat wall along the entire frontage of the wharf um, made out of the signature Stony Creek granite. And then um, there are World's Fair benches which are located within the Gardens of Remembrance. Views of the water are a big part of the experience of the battery. Even when you're quite far back where that orange line is in the winter, you can see, um, you can have glimpses at least of the water. And then there are framed views and really intentional views to significant features like at the East Coast Memorial, um, straight out to the Statue of Liberty. And then throughout the park, there, there are incidental views um, of the water horizon throughout the Bosque. Um, then looking more closely at that water horizon um, in section, you can see that 
standing back within the park, part of the reason that the water is so big in your perception is because of the way that the edge of the park drops down towards the water. The advantage of the plus 11 elevation is that it provides protections for sea level rise without eliminating the view of the water entirely. Um, so after the elevation of the wharf, we won't see quite as much water in the foreground, but it, it will still be visible on the horizon. The park is full of artworks and memorials. Um, and at the wharf, there are several that we're being very careful not to impact. Um, the river that flows two ways, the East Coast Memorial and the American Merchant Mariners Memorial are, the among, are among the most significant and the Gardens of Remembrance. Um, there are also landmark structures uh, within range of our site. Um, Castle Clinton and Pier A are both landmark structures that we don't anticipate impacting um, through our work. Uh, the wharf slips serve different um, vessel operations, including the New York water taxi, which boards via floating dock, and then statue cruises, which boards directly from the wharf for trips to the Statue of Liberty. And the operations of all the vessels are, um, will continue with the elevation of the wharf. So the project has several design goals. Um, in broad strokes, it's preparing for climate change, supporting the current site uses, and preserving the character of the existing park. And that includes existing trees and plantings to the landmark structures and views. Um, our design concept um, we'll show you here in plan. The darker green here is signifying new and restored planting, and the yellow is signifying ramps, 8.33% ramps with handrails. Our scheme preserves the basic circulation layout and geometry of the current design, but it integrates a greater number of ramps for accessibility to the wharf. Um, and in general, where once you stepped down to the wharf, now you're stepping up to get to the wharf, the same amount of steps. Uh, the next slide shows our proposed design in greater detail. This is showing how we maintain connections from the major bus path corridors onto the wharf through stairs and ramps. And then um, you go directly from the wharf. Um, you can go directly to the wharf or remain at the high point within the Gardens of Remembrance. Um, the Gardens of Remembrance are raised with the wharf and remain the high point of the wharf, looking across the garden beds to the water. Um, this final view is looking down that corridor of the Gardens of Remembrance, um, which is very similar to its current condition um, in that it's a continuous visual corridor um, parallel to the wharf um, and is, is registers as a kind of narrow garden path, but ramps are integrated, you can see, so there's a little bit of up and down as you're um, walking along this path. And that is all. Okay, so this is a, a high level project schedule. Um, as, um, as you can see, we are right in the middle of our concept and schematic design or concept design phase. Um, and um, our public meeting is scheduled for, for next week, the 24th or two weeks from now, the, the 24th. And we'll be continuing into schematic design, preliminary design and final design through the coming months. And, um, Finishing our finishing our final design in um, in mid to late 2022. And one thing I'd just like to make sure to address here is that um, uh, while we had obviously initially uh, planned for for this project to be in construction by the end of this year, um, the the COVID delay is pushing us into next year. But um, you know we are you know sort of laser focused on getting this moving quickly. Um, and I, I will say, um, and Jennifer and Joanna can add on here if there are any questions, but we have already uh, retained a construction manager for this project. So uh, we are still looking to move, move forward quickly, even though we did have about an eight or nine month uh, COVID related delay on the project. Any, any questions? How do I raise my hand? I have a question. I think is that is that you, Laura Starr? Did I hear you? It is. Wait, I'm trying to get. I can't figure out the hand raising or anything. Don't worry about it. I hear you. You're acknowledged. Go ahead and ask your question. And thank you for. Maybe I missed this. Um, 
Did you guys talk about the the water behind where, you, where you're elevating the esplanade? What are you doing? How are you treating the water behind it? That's have effect that you're creating. This is, this is Greg. I can take that one. Um, we're very aware of the the potential for creating a bathtub effect. Um, we, as I said, we're still in concept design, and we're very, and we're uh, still also com completing our on-site investigations um, to map out all the existing drainage system on-site to understand mm -hmm. how sea level rise may affect the existing system. So it's something we're aware of, and then something that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just have another thing to note. So you're raising the Esplanade in the battery to 11, but I believe that the Esplanade in Battery Park City is not being raised. So like all the, the flooding risks that you guys are addressing in the battery are not really being addressed for all the money that the Battery Park City Authority is spending. They're not addressing their comparable waterfront, the elevation of their comparable waterfront walkway, even though they're doing all this other inland work from there. I'm just noting that. It's a good you know, question. Can, for, I, I, yeah, sorry, well, can you bring back the slide that sort of shows the, the three areas that was a terrific slide that I think spoke to that so we could just look at it while you answer. Yeah, and, and obviously the Battery Park City Authority is here, um, but I, I did just want to note and really um, make sure no. to, to to make clear with everyone that um, while the other projects in the LMCR portfolio are focused on providing um, storm surge level protection, uh, which is a greater level of protection than this project is, is, is going to be um, affecting upon the area, um, we are still just just wanted to draw that distinction. So the um, the, the the flood protection projects in Battery Park City in the financial district and Seaport, um, although that is of course master plan ongoing, and then in the two bridges neighborhood are going to be designed to 2050s um, uh, 2050s hundred year storm surge, a, a Sandy equivalent storm in the 2050s. Um, and well, that wasn't my that wasn't my point though. So of course, Laura. And, so, and then, you know, th this, this project is, we um, already needed to replace the wharf anyway, um, and we're, we're going to be designing it to a sea level rise standard um, in order to protect the park's use during normal times. But of course, that, there's a chance that, it may still also, have. With all due respect, that also wasn't my point. My no, point I know. was yeah, I, I, that the comparable Esplanade in Battery Park City was remaining at its current location, its current elevation, which I think may be unfortunate because to the point of this presentation, there will be flooding. The reason you're raising this is because, you know, you have to rebuild it anyway, but also over time it's going to flood and be unusable more, more frequently. And it's kind of disappointing that in Battery Park City, the main way of circulating around the waterfront is now for all the money they're spending is still at the same elevation it is now, which means it's going to frequently flood in the future. That's my point. It's not a um, criticism. This project actually is, you know, looks like it's it's coming along very well. It was more a comment on comparing this to what's next door that we've seen a few times. Again, can I ask, that's a great question, Laura, but again, there's a slide that speaks to it and it's not this one. There's one that shows the whole of Battery Park with this project, there's a section, um, it's right around this slide. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, and maybe Gwen. Um, yeah, that's the one exactly. Thank you, um, at Gwen. Would well, actually, that isn't the one. Maybe I've gotten confused. No, not it sure. might have been this one that shows the the idea of putting the berm and the that's the AECOM berm over there. That 18.5 thing. I, that is the one. Yeah, I think that is. Yeah. In any case, uh, Gwen do you, Dawson, I don't know if you're here or Nick Spordone, do you want to speak to that at all or? Uh, Nick or, or Gwen from the Battery Park City Authority. Um, I see your names here. Just don't. Okay. Well, well it's um, all right. I just wanted to, I just wanted to note it for, just for the record. So. 
I mean, I know the city and the state, I know everybody's like struggling to figure out what should be the elevation of the shoreline and, you know, and, and that obviously you have to take advantage of like this, this had to be rebuilt anyway. So it makes sense. And maybe the battery park city one was not in such bad condition. It's just odd for all the kind of tectonic shifting around of grades and everything over there that they're doing in reality the you know the idea that the waterfront will flood a lot after all that work is and that's their big loop around the water like there's their inland circulation doesn't even isn't really continuous so their main way of, of like if you're going for a run or a ride along the waterfront their main way of circulating is going to be wet in the future that's all i'm trying to say it's a very, it's a very, very important point and how these projects relate to one another is one of the things we wanted to look at tonight. So I'm hoping, um, I don't know if you can hear me, Nick, or I see your name here and Gwen, but I would hope that before the end of this presentation, we can hear from you about that question and just generally how right, these over here. Yeah. Uh, line, Maybe on uh, uh, like an intentional meeting. Receipt too is Oh, this, I don't. The way that uh, Diana, hey, are they on the intentional meeting? Like, I don't think so. But. Uh, the COVID package. Hey, Alice. Yeah, there you are. Hey, I'm here. Yeah, Gwen was texting me saying she was muted. I think. Oh, uh, Diana, yeah. could you unmute um, Gwen Dawson and? Yeah, let me take a look. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, no. Hi, Gwen. Are you there? Can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Okay, thank you. Is. Hi, Gwen. Welcome. Hi, thank you. And and um, we also have um, someone from the ACOM team on, Andrew Lavely, um, who is also muted. If someone could make sure that he is unmuted. I just um, he Andrew will... over so he should be able to unmute himself if he needs to speak. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, great. Diana. Thanks, well, Alice. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, I, I think that, you know, the, your, your question is, um, is a question that, that, that we have asked, um, as well. And, um, we, um, um, want to make sure that we are being consistent. And I understand that with the, the, the wharf, um, project, they're looking at a, at a different planning horizon than the other, um, a lower Manhattan coastal resiliency projects that are currently um, in um, design are looking at. We are looking at um, storm surge that would um, that would protect against a 100-year storm event in the year 2050. Um, whereas the Battery Wharf project is looking at sea level rise for 2100. And of course, it raises the question of, of what should we be looking at? And um, certainly we all, I think, agree that we like to have the, the greatest protection for as long as we can. Um, that being said, um, we, we have um, projections that um, allow us to make certain predictions in terms of storm events um, in the year 2015 that become more con, you know, conjectural after that. Um, and also we have the, the reality that the, um, the infrastructure that is required to, um, to take it to a level of uh, design flood elevation that would apply in the year 2100 um, is um, something that is, is um, very, significant both in terms of the intervention required, the costs that are required. So our approach um, has been to um, create um, a design approach that would um, be adaptable over time. Um, now that's, I think that the ultimate reality is that at some point in time, the um, relieving platform and Planade, um, uh, Battery Park City over an extended horizon will need to be significantly modified, if not replaced. That's not the that's not the solution that we're looking at 
at this point in time uh, with the 2050 planning horizon. Um, our planning horizon here is, is consistent with the planning horizon for the BNCR and the ESCR. Um, and the, um, the level of the Esplanade is actually being um, elevated somewhat to a level of 95 um, in the, uh, for the remainder of the, the South BPC. Andrew, I don't, do you have anything to add to that? Andrew from SiteWorks. So, uh, you're, you're right that we are we are raising the platform to uh, elevation nine at the southernmost tip as you look out towards the Statue of Liberty. That's where the Esplanade bends and turns around and passes uh, Pier A Plaza. Uh, we also have the ability to peel into the park at elevation 11 uh, because what, what happens is that as you round the corner of Pier A, there is a ramp access that would let you get into the park. So if we were to have elevation 11 flooding, there is a shortcut that's baked into the design. So uh, so the idea that you would get your feet wet at a, a certain uh, high water event uh, is, is not going to be the case because we, we've actually provided a number of shortcuts through the park that allow us to maintain that elevation 11 capabilities. And the Esplanade is not a fixed uh, elevation along the water edge. Its low point is in fact at the tip that overlooks the Statue of Liberty. So we, we have taken that into account, but uh, we did not raise the tip uh, at the Statue of Liberty viewing point. That also allows us to have a stronger connection to the water for the Pier A Plaza and trying to do some echo restoration projects there. So all of these were compromises, but we are providing uh, safe passes through the park in the event that we do hit an elevation 11 flood. Okay, thank you. That's helpful to hear. Um, Laura, did you have any follow up there? Or are you? Okay, um, let's, uh, I see Bob Schneck. Welcome, Bob. Okay, I'm on. I'm on. You are indeed. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start by uh, admiring the simplicity of the project. I like the fact that uh, it's a very simple solution that applies uh, along the whole area of uh, the battery park. And I think, and I kind of like it for being simple and hopefully uh, there's some good economics for that simplicity. So one thing I was wondering about is, uh, is some kind of comparison between the budget for this kind of project and how this project kind of compares to the Battery Park City project that it's, a, a, that it's immediate, uh, immediately adjacent to. So is there some kind of sense of how much this, this costs and how much that costs at this point in time? Is, or is, has someone tried to do that? Yeah, so um, I'd like to ask um, whether, I don't have a, off the top of my head whether Jordan or Jennifer could share the, the budget for this project. Bob, I don't, I, I don't, we certainly don't have a comparison at this point. We haven't gotten into, um, you know, deep enough design, but we, we, we could talk about the budget for this project. I think in the long term, community board should be responsible where we're learning about this stuff. Learning about it also should really include how much it costs <laughs> and how it works over the long run and how even how even these things are financed for. But the next question I have is yeah, and, and um, really why... Quick, really, if, if you don't mind, um, I would like to see if, um, I don't know if Jordan or Jennifer can come off mute if they have the permission to. Um, the, the project is entirely funded by, by city capital uh, right now, but um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Yes, hi there, uh, it's Jordan Salinger from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Um, okay. Uh, budget uh, is at 165 million for this project. Uh, that was based off of um, kind of earlier concept design. So, you know, we'll say as a, a, a preliminary number. Um, but uh, as of now, I, you know, I think we're holding uh, 165 million uh, in mind uh, for this for this work. Yeah, and this that's is, right. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, and that's specifically just for the, the war free building and. Um, of that outline area you see in the text line. And that, thank you, Jennifer and, and, and Jordan. That that reminds me um, before I 
forget uh, Alice and, and Diana and folks, I, I owe you a, a breakdown over email of, of the individual projects, which which I do have. I just need to put that together and send it to you. So I'll get that to you tomorrow. Yeah, I was going to bring that up on Bob's question <laughs> and, and a presentation me. at some point. Yeah, great. Right, Thank right, you. Of course. And, and Bob, so sorry, Bob, back to you. Okay, so the next thing I was wondering about is this was built at an elevation 11, I think. Why wasn't it built? But this was to storm surge protection. Um, how was the 11 decided? Were it, and why, if uh, if there's a danger that this is going to be overcome at some point, is there some kind of secondary protection that's behind this in the battery that kind of makes everything work and protects the city behind it? Is it planned like that? Yeah. yeah Could you? Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's a great question, Bob. And I think the you know just to start the, um, uh, the this is a sea level rise intervention at, at the front of the park, and the idea is that the Battery Park City Authority project, as well as the FIDI Seaport project, um, at the which would both be more or less at the rear of the park, would protect the the upland properties um, and buildings and residences and businesses and all that from a uh, from a sandy like event in the 2050s. Um, the the idea here is that um, you know it, it's very difficult to uh, whereas those projects are, are building to 18 feet or more, it's very difficult to get that sort of elevation at the front of the park without taking away what makes the park so special, which is seeing out for the harbor and all of that. Um, so the idea is to make sure that the park is continues to be usable on a day-to-day -day basis um, by you know protecting against the sea level rise, but uh, you know also acknowledging that there may be a if there's another sandy like event, God forbid, um, that the the upland neighborhoods would be protected by the projects which are to be constructed at the at the rear of the park. Yeah, I, I also just, to say that, I could no, just add, that, you know, whatever we're, you know, we're very early in design and we're, um, you know, what we're doing is making sure that whatever we design can be adaptable for the future. And, you know, obviously this is meant to address sea level rise out in the next. 80 years, um, so we want to make sure this is flexible design um, for the park as well. I was wondering, in terms of flexible design, did anyone think of different kinds of barriers you could put on to this wharf kind of, uh, you know, just so you you pre-design it so you can kind of bulk it up in the in the case of a storm or something. It's something that we're, we're thinking about, but you know, but we haven't set that yet, and um, we need to do a lot of evaluations to see what that is the park, and um, obviously, like how the how the structure is being built. All of that is still yet to be determined. So I was wondering about. I was wondering about the transition areas on the Coast Guard side and then for the ferry, the Staten Island Ferry right next to it. I always wondered how you could, how, how people were even thinking about protecting something like that. So even just an insight as to how it's possible. And then uh, on the other side, how that's going to handle Pier A. So how these, how these transitional things are going to be handled, I think is important. Yeah, so I, I can handle the Coast Guard side and then I'll turn it over to the team for the PRA side. But Bob, that's that's sort of the biggest number one question, right? Um, and I think if you go to the, um, if we go to the slides showing at what point the, the wharf itself is really impacted by sea level rise, again, the the um, sort of design um, useful life of this project is is 80 years for, for the wharf that we will be building. Um, so yeah, if we're looking at 2100s, then of course there is some inundation on, on land but if we look back to maybe about the 20, uh, excuse me, the 2050s, um, we are, you know, it's still within the bounds of the of the 11 feet, at least from a sea level rise perspective. Bob, I think it's a great question, and that sort of, you know, is one of the primary challenges that we have here because at this location we have a funded capital project, and to the east and uh, and north for the Fidei Seaport areas, we have a an ongoing master plan, which, as you know, is obviously trying to um, make sure to propose something that is fundable and implementable, but we still do need capital funding for that. Um, so I think, you know, as the design of this, pro of, of this project progresses, um, like I mentioned, we expect to be in construction on this project by the end of 2022. 
Um, and obviously there's going to be more details worked out on both this side and on the financial district and seaport uh, master plan. But there is more work to be done on, on the tie-in on the eastern side, particularly because, as you noted, we have the intersection of um, Park's property, we have the Coast Guard facility, we have the DOT facility at Whitehall. Um, also below ground, you have the um, MTA, the, the the one train loop. Right. A lot of challenges there. So <laughs> right. you know, I would say that um, you know we are focused on on you know within the context of this conversation, we have the we have the funding to construct the project that. You see here on the battery wharf itself and then you know obviously going to remain very well coordinated since we are also running the financial district and seaport project um, for that link to the east but obviously making sure that these projects work together is is the most critical thing um, regarding pier a i know that there have been more advanced conversations considering that's another funded capital project so um, others want to chime in on that uh of many many other questions uh, Bob, uh, I think I we're getting an answer we... on Pier A, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So let, let's just hear that before we ask another uh, I question. Um, yeah, I can start that off. Um, we are coordinating um, on an almost daily basis with Battery Park City Authority on the design and the tie-in at Pier A, um, something you know we're working closely with them on to make sure everyone's needs are met and that we do have that continuity um, and that the the wharf project really tees back into um, the berm project at the back of the park uh, so uh, we don't have that uh, that design finalized yet but um, you know it you can see kind of the outline and some shapes here a lot of that is being tweaked to meet everyone's needs um, Gwen, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, this is Andrew. Yeah, the, uh, it, 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 oh, um, uh, let, let me let me just make it um, a mention first, and Andrew, you can you can talk to it in, in more detail because you have a, you have a, a better view of it than I do. But um, you know, as as I think all of you recognize, um, it who have seen the presentation about the the South Battery Park City project. Um, the Pire Plaza has been designed with two levels, um, and the upper level has been designed to go inside with the 11-foot elevation of the Battery Wharf project. And so the, the design approach is to link that elevation of the Battery Wharf project into the upper level of the Pire project, uh, of Pire Plaza. Uh, Andrew, please um, um, continue and, and provide any additional insight that you think is appropriate. Yes, yeah, so what we're looking at right now is the interface. So we, we have uh, the, the walkway that's being proposed by the Stantec team is coming into elevation 11, which hits the upper level of the uh, Pier A Plaza. And then you see that yellow area, which is the ramp down to the lower level elevation 6 of the uh, in front of the Pier A building. Uh, we're closely coordinating on uh, where those two are located so that we can preserve uh, as many trees as possible along the edge of Battery Park. Uh, and we're tweaking the shapes to make sure that uh, we're able to meet Park's desires uh, and Rory's desire to sort of preserve the maximum amount of green along the edge of the battery, but still provide some uh, access down to the lower elevation six plaza. So we're, we're currently right now just trying to figure out uh, the exact geometries that are being done there. I think in concept, we're in agreement. Uh, we, we know where the circulation is going to go. We're just trying to locate uh, in plan uh, the actual configurations. Could somebody answer uh, in the future? It'd be great to have a slightly larger plan of view of just that area, but because um, I think it's a really obviously a critical joint in many ways. Um, have, has everyone I, was this discussion that Pier A may someday be turned into something else than it is today, and included in that something else was the discussion of it maybe being even a ferry terminal where boats would pull in? Have all your plans addressed that possibility? Um, Alice, a couple of things. So really quick, I think um, we, we are sort of zoomed out to this level, um, frankly, because we're, we're just at the, at the concept design level. So um, sort of as an overview of where we are in the process, the, um, the sort of design team work really began in earnest in January um, or resumed in earnest in January. So 
uh, once we're in the preliminary design phase, we'll have a lot more detail. We'll have a lot more. And I think especially, um, you know, in, in terms of interagency coordination, we'll be, we'll be a lot more zoomed in. Um, Alan, uh, just, yes. say this is Gwen, sorry to interrupt, but um, just in terms of the, 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 the future use or utilization of PRA, certainly there are, are a number of possibilities that, that exist for that. And, um, you know, we are, are um, we are confident that the uh, exterior um, configurations would be adaptable to a variety of different uses, and we don't there's we don't know exactly um, what that um, that would be um, or when it would happen. And um, so we are we are maintaining as much flexibility as possible with the design of the plaza and the interface of the. Uh, the various components of the resilience infrastructure um, to accommodate um, a variety of different uses. Well, it's good to hear, Gwen, and we'll just answer you. We, we as the community board, have seen actually quite a lot of detailed um, presentation, a detailed presentation rather of the PRA Plaza. So I guess that we just would be great to have that drawing here. But I see, I um, see. Yeah, so we're but two, anyway, different, two different groups overseeing the design. Well, that, so there's, that, the, there's the that's one. why you're both here invited here today. Right, right. Um, right. Yeah, and, yeah, it makes sense. And, and you know, I would just say, Gwen, we talked about it at, at the last meeting when you showed us um, mm -hmm. southern your, the southern Battery Park resiliency plans. That it's it seems critical that both sides of this spot really do consider what the traffic and what the reality would be if this were to become a ferry terminal. I mean, I understand that's not a complete pie in the sky thought, and it would be really a shame if something were, you know, designed and built, God forbid, that didn't accommodate the possibility for that. So I just really hope that going forward that that's addressed, um, you know, head on. And I really appreciate that it sounds like you are doing that. Um, Absolutely, anyway. our, our goal would, would would not be to preclude any use of of the of, of the pier um, by virtue of of some sort of constraint on on the design of the plaza. We would not want that to happen. Right. Great. Okay, Michael Frankauer. Ah, thanks, Alice, uh, and thanks everyone for the presentation. Um, and my question was, uh, how long do you expect uh, like a new pier to last? Um, I, I ask, I think both because I'm curious and because um, from my like very amateur understanding of like climate change modeling, I think sea level rise is one of the more difficult for uh, researchers to predict. Um, so it's not crazy to think we could end up in a situation in 2050, 2070, I don't know, maybe earlier, maybe later, maybe, sorry, later where um, sea level rise is increased beyond the, the height that we're, we're um, building for right now. In that situation, would you be expecting to like wait until the expected lifetime of this pier is over and rebuild higher? Are you building it in a way that allows you the flexibility to increase its height um, without completely um, deconstructing it? Or would you be expecting to allow um, flooding to happen and just use uh, the back of the park uh, to prevent more serious flooding? Yeah, Michael, that's a great question around, you know, there are a lot of unknowns here, clearly, and these are projections. Um, so we are, we are looking at the 90th percentile. So a, you know, a pretty conservative and aggressive estimate, of course, but obviously there is 91 and 92 all the way up to 100, you know, as far as how bad things could possibly get. But, you know, I think we are designing to a conservative standard. Um, the useful life of the, of the wharf as we're designing it today is expected to be about 80 years. Um, so that takes us just past 2100. Um, I would say that, you know, in per some of the, the slides that Greg showed um, at the very beginning, we are seeing throughout the city um, all of these sort of old industrial piers that have been repurposed to recreational use, um, all of the wooden piles as the um, as the water quality per, per our first presentation, as the water quality gets better and better and better in the harbor, um, we are having a lot of issues with especially marine borer in, infestation. So these wooden piles are getting eaten away by creatures that can now survive in the water. So we see this citywide on, on piers that EDC manages. So I would say, um, you know, just generally that that might be somewhat of an aside to your question, but, um, you know, given the, the difficult history of, of what's been happening lately with a lot of piers and challenging uh, states of repair lately, uh, we are designing this with approximately an 80 year uh, useful life. 
into that 90 percentile. I think that, that's an interesting point of um, recommendation that in regard to considering what we can do within the design to, you know, accommodate a little bit extra later on without having to completely start from scratch. Um, I do know that the ESCR project in the Lower East Side is considering, you know, building some elements in place so that they can add on um, in mid-century or later if needed, um, which is an interesting design concept I think we can certainly consider. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Great. Okay, um, Laura Starr, another question, I think. Okay, there, I'm unmuted. Um, so back to the, the Pire Plaza question, it sounds like the design is still in flux and being kind of negotiated between the city's project and the Battery Park City Authority's project. Is that the case? I wouldn't exactly put it that way. I don't think it's that it's, it's in flux. There is, um, there, everything has actually been pretty well coordinated um, with the exception of the the very easternmost boundary where um, there needs to be a vehicle ramp that um, that leads to the lower uh, level of the plaza. Um, mm -hmm. We all agree that the ramp needs to be there. We all agree um, in terms of the, the type of atmosphere that um, needs to be created there. We're just working on the details of the exact um, alignment and the configuration and the nature of the things that would be um, edging that ramp. So I'm asking because, and I missed a meeting, so I could be completely wrong, but it was my understanding that, um, Gwen, that the Battery Park City Authority is part of the project that's in city jurisdiction is going to the PDC for final review this month. And it's, like, I, I went on the, it, when? Yeah, it, it's to be submitted at the end of April um, for uh, the May uh, paid, uh, PDC hearing. Uh, okay, all right, so, okay. Um, no, I was wondering because I went on the, because the meeting, I, I missed your presentation the last time and I went, on your website and look at the design and it looks still very schema, very conceptual for this part of the park for the wall, you know, going into the battery and the period plaza area. But then I had heard it was going to PDC final and the drawings didn't look at all final. So I'm just wondering, will the community board, will we be able to see? Um, I mean, I guess I should say, I'm sure we'll be able we, to see the more advanced design before it goes to the to the PDC, right? Because the community board is supposed to re right. review we, them. We did, we, we addressed this um, at the at the last um, committee meeting um, and agreed that we would, um, we would bring the final uh, PDC package um, to um, the committee for presentation before we submit it to PDC. Okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize that. Thank you. Okay, so actually that isn't what I, exactly what I recall, so I'm glad to hear it. So in fact, you have the time, because I thought you had told us that we would have the time in the April meeting, but now we will have but, the time to but, review it. I mean, we, we do, we do, we do have to, we do have to pinpoint dates and, and okay. the thing that we were concerned about is whether or not we would make, we would make the environmental committee meeting or if it would be to be shifted but um, we, but I think I think we can probably make it work that that committee meeting work. We just need to pinpoint the date. Okay, that's great to hear, Gwen, and thanks for asking that, Laura, because we really do need to follow up. And and at that meeting, um, I don't know if somebody from um, Parks there or EDC, um, just to make sure we fully understand, you know, entering into the park and how Pure Plaza will work if it's, you know, what it is today, or if it becomes a ferry terminal, how that would, you know, just tracing how folks would get there, how people with bikes would get there, where people will park themselves and all that good stuff if we could get into that level of detail at that point. And, and Let's just, just to really follow quick. up on that. Sorry, Will, just to follow okay. up on that, um, it would be good to hear if there's a long-term plan yet for where the, 
boats to the Statue of Liberty are going and how the security will be handled or whether you're planning to put these awful tents back after the wharf, the beautiful wharf project opens and that whole thing, which maybe you don't have organized yet, but we're definitely interested in it. That would be actually can can Grace um, Chang, can you speak to that? What you know, I'm not sure who speaks to what, but <laughs> that that question as to those pesky tents and where those will go, is that the idea that they would go right back to where they are today? You know, you're right in that it is a complicated question that we've been um, thinking about for a while and we have engaged with NPS a couple times over the course of this project, you know, with more coordination to be done. I mean, we've, uh, you know, our commitment is to keep the Statue of Cruises boats operational during construction and after. I think there's just a lot of moving pieces as to, you know, what the final location is for the tent and the boats. So again, just for the purposes of kind of like helping Stantec move the design along, we've just conservatively said, okay, let's just put it back where it is today for now, but that is certainly not necessarily um, the case. So it's TBD. Well, while we have everybody here, is there obviously there's some interest in not having it there by many parties, maybe including yourself. Is this, what, what, what do you all feel would be the best way to move that? Move that off, you know, move that tent, you know, like, where, what, what, what yeah, would be, especially what because do do? it's, it belongs to, it's really part of the federal government's operation. And we now have a friendly federal government to New York. So I would, I'm hoping we can seize the moment here with this, the democratic lineup we have to maybe get some action going. Any thoughts there from EDC parks or battery park city authority and on the idea that puree might be a possible place for that. You know, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting idea and, um, you know, obviously there's multiple stakeholders at the table here, both city parks and national parks. As well as BPCA, of course, um, BPCA is EDC's tenant at at PRA, so they have jurisdiction over a lot of what goes on there. Uh, but I do think, you know, for all of us, it, it would be interesting to sort of hear from. From the community as we, as we go along in this design process of, of what you all are interested in seeing and what your priorities are. Um, and, you know, that, that could be, that could certainly be something that you express interest in and. Um, you know, I think we are, whereas the Battery Park City Authority project to the north, um, sort of to, to the question Laura was asking earlier about coordination, um, while they are a lot farther along, the, the, the Battery Wharf itself is, you know, we are still on concept design and planning to go to PDC with the concept design, which is more or less this presentation next month. Um, so, you know, we're much earlier in the, in, in the conversation and we can continue to, to talk about that since it's, it's obviously come up more than once. <laughs> Yeah, and I think actually it's coming up again tomorrow night at the Waterfront oh, right. Park Committee, where we'll really talk about that very idea. So uh, to be continued, I realize it's it's getting late, and I know we have another item on the agenda, so I don't want to. Uh -oh. Can I just for that, quickly but... say yeah, no, something? Go ahead. I mean, what the community wants is we want to be able to walk and jog along that esplanade and not run into that tent, like community access to the water 101. That like if that's it. Like, just find a place for it that is not in front of Castle Clinton, which is a really important landmark. It's, you know, blocking the Esplanade. It's in, it's in one of the, the battery gets, you know, it's one of the most visited open space spaces mm -hmm. in the country. And we've got this ugly tent in the middle of it. So I would just say, if you need, the community board is on your side. If you need us to start writing to Chuck Schumer or to Jerry Nadler or whatever we need to do, we're here to help. I think this is the moment because, you know, we've, we've got a good lineup, as I said, so just. I'd like to say something happens. on that too, though. I mean, I'm, I'm not expressing an opinion 1 way or the other. You just the, introduced who who's this, talking, please. This is Jeff Galloway. Oh, um, hi, Jeff. Uh, in, in the past, the community board has strongly opposed putting the Staten, uh, the Statue of Liberty ferry on pier a. Uh, now, maybe the community board doesn't care about that anymore, but there, there was very, very strong opposition to that in the past when it was considered the last time around. So, you know, it's sort of like the tour buses. Nobody wants them in a particular place, but when you start to identify an alternative place, there's another set of people that don't want it there uh, either. So 
I, I wouldn't say it's just a simplistic issue of booting it out of Castle Clinton and putting it on the Pier A, unless there's been a change of view among the members of the community board and the community. No, system. I'm just saying that it should be dealt with. It's just supposed to be dealt with as part of this project, and we want to be supportive of the city in dealing with it, because I know nobody wants it where it is. Uh, I'm not saying that I want it there either. I'm just saying that before we pick a unlucky location for it, we need to consider what may be uh, the, the views of the people. And consider, we will, Jeff, and tomorrow night, uh, you know, as I said, I think that is um, something that will be discussed. So I think there's no question that's not something we're just going to, you know, sew up tonight. And, and you're absolutely right that it has, you know, more sides than one. Um, so, but I think Laura's point is well taken that we, we certainly want to look at the security tent issue while doing the work, given that it's on it. And it seems like it's rather, I think we would all agree, somewhat an unresolved condition at that point in the park. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not opposing it personally as to Pier A uh, I, I either, but I'm just pointing out that there was significant opposition to yeah. it in the past. Right, thank you. I, uh, if I could jump in for a second on this. Uh, could I get I've, everyone to raise their hand and I will call on you, I promise. So let me, just so I can know who's talking. So is that you, Tom Burton? Is that? Yes. Okay, yes, hey, is. Tom. Go ahead. Hey. Uh, am I, uh, can I go? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, first, I want to just applaud this whole design project and the way you're approaching it. Uh, this is the best example I've seen so far of real community engagement and getting our input. Um, and uh, so thank you um, to all involved. And uh, uh, I, I will, I will uh, allow that I've been consult consulted by this committee and this group, and I appreciated the chance to put in to to have input and uh, and that they're considering, you know, uses of boats such as mine. You know, I, I have a company called Manhattan by Sail for all, all you know for self disclosure, and we're a sub tenant of Statue Cruises uh, in in the park, and uh, and. Uh, so the the fact that the use, that use is also being considered and discussed is is uh, you know very encouraging um, and perhaps just to throw that in there for Pier A as well that it it would be not just a ferry terminal but maybe some flexibility there for other types of boats that could use such an iconic location and uh, and you know and be as be there as a resource. Um, so maritime flexibility, you know, just uh, as a catchword. <laughs> um, I'll leave it there. Uh, I think that um, the the one concern I have, and I don't want to take up uh, committee time or, or time here, is that you had uh, acknowledged that the 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 there's an emergency action shutting down the, the rest of the departure locations, um, and uh, and. And because of that, uh, the sub license that I was expecting to be renewed this year after a, a pretty hard year last year was I was told by a statute that I wouldn't be able to get. So right now I'm without a peer uh, or a place to operate my business from. But uh, if there's any uh, if there's somebody at EDC or, you know, that I can communicate with um, in terms of what fixes might be available, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, and uh, I know it's a self-interested comment, and I apologize for for doing that here. Uh, okay, well, you can take, yeah, I'm sure you can follow up here with any one of, maybe Will can help direct that. Um, I see one, and thanks, and I agree with Tom here. It was, you know, very, uh, you know, a, a excellent presentation, which was also, like Bob Schneck said, very simple and sort of clear and seems like it's a great beginning. From the two year point we had hit at the, at the last review. Um, so I see somebody from the community, Margaret Flanagan, put her hand up. I'm not sure if you're there. You go. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, can you all hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful for me to follow Tom because I share his interests in uh, maritime flexibility. I wanted to just ask a question with a comment to please um, consider a uh, boating use of the wharf uh, for flexibility in the future. So to perhaps include the bollards where the ships dock lines 
all down the length of the wharf, not just at the little slip areas, because that would enable uh, future flexible use. Uh, along those lines, um, for the height of the, Tom, Tom can probably give you the best recommendation for the height of those kind of timber pilings that'll be like fenders in the slip areas. In this initial design, they looked a little high, like they might interfere with the dock lines of the lower ships. Um, but uh, you have an expert right here who can help you understand that definitely. And just as we, again, look ahead with flexibility to a, a world that is managing climate change, to please also remember that many of these vessels are probably gonna have to go to electric plug-in for a battery system in the very near future. By 2050, international shipping is aiming for that goal. So as you're redesigning the wharf for the next century, to please include running a electrical conduit all the way up to the birthing areas now will prepare us to have the you know, renewable energy ships of the future that continue the maritime traditions in our harbor. And um, that's not just a point for this area, but also as, you, as our EDC team is probably looking at the FIDI seaport area, um, uh, to please remember to push utilities through the high built resilience to the waterfront, to the boats. And thank you for all that. Uh, very quickly to add uh, on to what you said, Maggie, uh, just that that the different heights that are being uh, try accommodated by those ramps uh, are 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 good. I, I'm going to be reviewing it and giving more comments later, but um, but that there be bollards at those heights because the as was pointed out, uh, a steep angle of uh, of incident for the for the mooring lines uh, creates uh, real instability for the boats. Thanks. Um, is there any response from the team at large there, or are we good? I think it's just a point. Yeah, I don't, I don't no, think so, you have so to take a look at. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just ask if Hope Cohen or Rory Price from the Conservancy have anything they'd like to add or say. Um, I know you were here as well. I don't know. I think you're still there about um, the plans or thoughts or not. Okay, so um, I see Megan Melbourne, I think she may be our last. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Up. Yeah. Hey, Megan. Hey, guys. Um, I just wanted to point out that the uh, I went. I got to go on a really cool hard hat um, uh, tour of the play space area, and there's a lot of uh, resiliency that's been built into that park. Um, because I just know that Bob Schneck was asking about that, and that's something I saw firsthand. So that's all. It's just a really cool park that has a lot of opportunity to also look cool and uh, save our city from getting overrun. It was fantastic. We had a fantastic presentation at last month's waterfront park um, uh, on that very area. Yeah, we're really excited about that. Thanks for bringing it up, Megan. Um, I think, Diana, are there any other, do any of our presenters have anything to add or anybody? Lori, Lori is trying to get in. She's on uh, mute. Oh, let me go to Lori. I thought I got her earlier. And I think there's some interesting feedback happening. Let me see if I can fix that as well. Hi, Rory, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. I was muted for a while. I wanted to respond to Alice's uh, aspect that <clears throat> we have been made aware of uh, uh, all of the designs that are being presented, and we've come up with various ideas of what we want to ensure uh, can be retained uh, certainly the river that flows two ways, which is the art piece that now exists along the water's edge. The double, we have six gangways operable now. As you can see, there are five that are being presented, but they're doubles. So in many ways, the use of the, of the, of the water is uh, doubled for maritime use uh, because you've got these uh, flexible slips and uh, but it does broaden a sense of of the uh, view corridors there are fewer 
open areas because your slips are taking up a lot more room, which is what the previous two speakers are hopeful that we have. And I think this plan is doubled of uh, the fender system uh, that they talked about and also uh, gives the flexibility of sea level rise by offering two levels at each one of these slips. The other is the retention of important elements. And I had asked that the Stony Creek granite that is the same granite as the pedestal of the statue. Plus it's a beautiful stone and it continues around the entire perimeter of the park. If there was any way to reuse that in the design. And then we are very appreciative that there still will be a visual contact of the water hitting the, the, the plain of land out in Brooklyn and, uh, and our, uh, the rest of the harbor and then the sky plane by keeping it the plus 11, it doesn't completely um, prohibit the view. It's, it certainly is smaller, but it is still there. And we've kind of gotten our heads around that the boss becomes the sunken gardens now. In a sense, you will be up high as you walk the wharf and then you walk down into more of a sunken garden feeling versus the way you feel about it now. Um, and we know our plantings and all of that will be able to survive through that also. Um, we. We truly are glad the gardens of remembrance have been retained because they really are a part of our history and the sense of that horticulture is a very, very important part that I think the community has embraced um, the new life of the battery, which is 240,000 square feet of gardens. So I think they've been very sensitive. I just hope that uh, various elements will be able to be brought into it that keep a little bit of that historic aspect that was put there before and that that sense of the usability of these slips also still retain the sense of the view. I mean, I think, you know, Melville had it correct. Everyone comes to be a water gazer. And so the views in that moment of greeting 11,000 acres of water from a landscape at the tip of Manhattan is very meaningful. And, um, and of course, I think everyone knows how much uh, the temporary, temporary, which as we know, <clears throat> has become a little bit long and it wasn't anyone's uh, idea, the Park Service had to put up a screening security facility for visitors to statue. They tried very hard to move it to Ellis Island at one point. So it's, uh, it is a need that for our security, uh, we need to do, but we do feel strongly that having it, um, outdoors versus could be included in a beautiful historic indoor facility which I believe is preferable. And people have heard me speak about that before. So this is not news to anyone. So the idea that everyone's listening, that everyone at this point in conceptual design, and I think the uh, battery place design is a little ahead of, uh, of the wharf, but I do think there has been a very uh, good sense of trying to include all the stakeholders in the discussions. And of course, the challenges are immense for us as a city. We are all making, uh, uh, we're, we're understanding the needs over the things we used to love the way they were. They're no longer able to stay that way. So getting our heads around the new experience that we all have to come to on this historic site, I think is something that uh, the coordinated sense of bringing all those issues is helping everyone into acceptance and into embracing. And we, of course, are the ones that are gonna to have to maintain it, to propagate it, to make it as beautiful and wonderful as we have over the last 25 years, or it hasn't been beautiful for 25 years, but the moment we began to where we are now. And, uh, and I do promise you a great playground uh, come, uh, which was nicely mentioned already tonight, but that will be also uh, built to flood.
I have to acknowledge that this was built after Sandy and it is built to flood and rainwater is dealt with properly. Stormwater management is dealt with properly. Uh, we know that we will have excess water and the playground is been built and designed to accommodate it. So I bring that up also that the park is really in the in the forefront of doing a lot to be able to serve the public as we move forward. Thank you for letting me speak. Oh, Wari, thank you for everything you do in that park. Um, I guess I just, um, I think we're at the end of the Q&A here. Um, could you just, Will, just review what is coming up next? What kind of regulatory meetings, you know, what's sort of ahead of us in terms of approvals? We probably will want to do a resolution um, yeah, or a letter just so that we have all of this wonderful information memorialized. I'm not sure we're going to do it tonight, but if we had time, we would do it next month. If not, we could potentially get over some points tonight. So just let us know the timing. Yeah, sure thing. So, um, Alice, you and Diana already have the, this presentation in your inboxes. Um, regarding next steps uh, 324, which is next uh, Wednesday evening from 6 to 8 p.m., we have a, um, a another public meeting that's scheduled just on this topic so that we could take as much time as we need on any other recommendations and feedback. Uh, the, the Conservancy and Warriors team has been really helpful in getting the word out for that, as has Nick and the Battery Park City Authority. Uh, we had a um, ad in the broadsheet this weekend and in the e-broadsheet that folks have been getting this week um, and are doing a lot of other outreach on that. So um, please, if uh, you know folks who would like to comment on this and haven't gotten a chance to this evening, please send them uh, the uh, link, which I'll send to Diana in the chat. Um, so um, I would also say regarding sort of regulatory approvals, et cetera, um, team, could we go to, uh, Greg, could we go to the timeline, please? So currently we're in the uh, conceptual design phase. We are going to be submitting um, a package largely comprised of this content to public design commission for conceptual review um, uh, in, a, I think in a couple of weeks for review at their April meeting. Um, and then we'll be moving on to the schematic design phase um, in late spring and early summer. And um, we will figure out sort of what the best way to engage with the community board as well as the broader community is on, on design from that point. I would say, um, obviously, in addition to sort of discrete projects, we also have the quarterly updates with the community boards. Um, and then we'll obviously keep you up to date with sort of any other timely conversations, such as those regarding coordination with BPCA. Um, you know, we would love to hear from you all with more detail on interest regarding peer A in as much as each of us in our individual jurisdictions control pieces of that. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think we were um, very glad to have this, um, the last project to come off of COVID pause, get started at uh, the Stantec team is, is I think doing a really phenomenal job and um, we're glad to have them back to work. And like I mentioned, we already have a construction manager on board. Um, so we're really ready to roll um, and glad that we're able to go full speed on this. Um, thanks so much, Will. I think it would be great if, um, and this is true for all the agencies here, if in the future all these regulatory approval pieces to the various projects at the various times they're happening, it would be incredibly helpful if you could add these onto your project timelines. All this information is wonderful, but that's always a little bit gray. For example, is it the is PDC in April or is it May? It sounds like Battery Park City Authority is going in May, but you all are going on this in April. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. We'll just be doing conceptual review. Okay, so, so we probably will. Um, I, I think Tammy is going to write a chair letter, I think, on some of the points that we've raised tonight, just to sort okay, of have, great. you know, you have it on record. Um, so I, I think that's where we're going to go as a committee on that. Um, and we'll take it from there. Uh, anybody else last last call before we move on to 251 Street? Oh, Bob. Could I? Yeah, yeah, ahead, yeah I think there's one 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 very important thing I, I would like to comment on that's that's an overarching issue all the time. And that is the HATS project um, that kind of considers, makes a comprehensive consideration of the harbor, the East River and the Hudson has never been completed and God knows where it is. So I think it's time to propose and ask for if the Army Corps of Engineers can't do it, 
it's obvious that with all these competing entities, it would be good to have a comprehensive kind of unified understanding of climate change, of the impact of sea level rise, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the impact of storm surge, the consideration of a possible barrier in the, uh, in the middle of the Hudson. This would be an opportunity to have information that would affect all the projects simultaneously, because even, even in the little rift between the uh, Wagner Park area and the, and the wharf area, there are differences of yawning differences of, of planning to different extents. And there should really be some kind of effort to kind of bring them all together. And the way to do that is to make a unified uh, study of all those things simultaneously. And if uh, now it's important to bring together city uh, New Jersey uh, and tri-state uh, kind of funding, some federal funding, because it's important to come to a, a single agreed approach to climate threats uh, rather than multiple approaches. It's important to right size all the projects and to really coordinate them into one thing. And however this gets funded, the EDC and all of the other entities can fund it if, however, however the funding for the uh, Army Corps failed, we need something, I think. And so I would like the I would like uh, our committee and all of you all to opine on that. Do we? It is is this the thing that we re, a thing that we really need? Seems to me that it is. I don't think you're going to get an argument from well, certainly not the committee, certainly not not me. Um, and I think Bob, you raised a good point, and we will definitely have the Army Corps uh, come and hopefully, you know, maybe reignite Bear Harbor tributary study that you're referring to. I think with the changing of the guard in DC, that seems um, hopeful, and I think it is high time for that. So I applaud that you ended on that note, something else for us to consider at, at an upcoming meeting and certainly everybody wouldn't be invited to that. So thanks for bringing that up. Bob. Um, I think with Bob, I think that was the last hand up and I want to thank the entire EDC parks conservancy Battery Park City Authority team for them all showing up. It's really, really great to have everybody sort of in one room. Um, it's critical to do it this way, and I'm really glad that we sort of started to get that all the team players in one place at one time to, to start to discuss these projects. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, Great. Thank you so much, Diana, Alice. Uh, I saw Wendy. I saw Bob. A lot of folks with your faces. Nice to see you all. Uh, we'll see this again soon. Yeah, we'll see you on 24th. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Great. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Alice. Stay safe. See you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. All. So um, we're now moving on to our last agenda item, which is 250 Water Street. There's going to be an update on the Brownfield Cleanup Program, which Diana Sweetai has kindly offered to do. And there is a little bit of information there. So, Diana, you want to take that one? Sure. Away? You know, we're we're in a bit of an in-between phase because our our community consultant Laura Dodge, her current work scope is 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 closing or closed. The last meeting that she attended was the February meeting. At that time, the community board adopted a resolution uh, requesting that Laura's work be renewed for the for the following phases of work, in particular, the remedial as the remedial action work plan for the Brownfield cleanup program is being developed. And then further on, you know, ideally, and I think from the beginning, the community board um, has requested that this consultant be on with us through the end of the Brownfield cleanup program. Um, so, since that meeting, and this logistically is is um, is interesting, but the community board itself isn't part of the actual negotiations. It's important for the community board not to be a part of those negotiations um, between Laura and between Howard Hughes Corporation, which has been funding her, especially given um, Howard Hughes's current proposals in front of the board. So. Right after we adopted that resolution, I reached out to the borough president's office, who has been the intermediary since the beginning. I spoke with Matthew Washington last week, and, and he had said that he's working with Laura to um, get a proposal from her, get a funding proposal from her, and liaise between Laura Dodge and Howard Hughes on, on potential next steps. So 
uh, that's where we are right now. We are we are eagerly awaiting <laughs> any developments on that front. And in the interim, there there were a few things that we had asked Laura to follow up on since the February meeting. Um, there was one question from Maggie Delal, which I know we got back to her. I think I forwarded that to her this morning. Um, and then there was that one letter that we received from the NYU professor that we had asked Laura to comment specifically on, which I have a memo on. I just received it before this meeting. Um, and then specific comment comments on the remedial investigation report, which um, Laura is going to be getting to us this week. So let me share this document and I had intended to be able to post it on the website before this meeting so I could share the link, but um, I received it just before the meeting. So it will be up by tomorrow and I'll give everyone the link of where they can find it. And I, while I'm pulling this up, I'll remind everybody that if they have a question or want to make a comment, um, please use the raise hand function or, uh, or you can message me. I'm the host. So this is the memo specifically commenting on um, the letter we received from Dr. Dr. Jack Caravanos from February 23rd, 2021. And Laura goes through, Alice, do you want me to go through each of these? You're muted, Alice. Probably a good thing. Um, I don't think so, because isn't this letter something that is accessible on our on our um, website, right? It's not so, yet, but uh, just because I received it just before this meeting, but right. it's, it's next on my list to well, complete. Why so don't you we'll, just leave we'll up tomorrow? I don't think you need to read it all, but just the first page, just so people can see the bolded. Uh, this was a specific letter that addressed specific questions that are important. I don't know that we have to go over each and every point. So the way that it's structured is that the bold portions are portions from the letter itself. And then the unbolded portions are Laura's responses. So anything that she wanted to elaborate on or answer to, she went through and broke it down that way. And then I'm just going to scroll, forgive anybody who I'm making nauseous, scroll quickly to the bottom here um, because she comments specifically that while we are still developing detailed comments on the draft remedial investigation report, but overall, our view of the draft is that it was well done and the site is sufficiently characterized so that the remedial action design and preparation of the draft remedial action work plan can proceed. Tom Facillo and I have a call scheduled with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Department of Health project teams this, this Thursday at 3, 8, 3 p.m. Therefore, I will provide a draft letter with my specific comments to you by the end of the day tomorrow so we can discuss. And I'm just, I'll post it in the chat in a moment, but this is the little section on our website where I'm going to be posting, um, posting this document and any specific comments on the, uh, Laura's comments on the remedial investigation report. Uh, and it also links to the 250 BCP website where the rest of the documents are. Great, Diana, thanks very much. Um, so, so everyone saw the, uh, where you could get this on the website, and I guess it'll be posted tomorrow. External information that's really fabulous. So, I see two hands. Um, Maggie Delal is talking about you, Maggie. I'm not sure if they need to be, and I see Megan after her. Yeah, there she goes. Can you guys hear me? You should be all set. Yeah. Hi, and Di Diana, thank you guys for getting me that um, information from Laura. I just wanted to take a quick, quick minute and share some of the stuff that um, came up because we didn't have time to get into it on the last meeting. Um, but one of the concerns that I was trying to raise was that when we got all that data that came out in February, um, <clears throat> they released numbers for VOC levels and mercury levels that were occurring just during the sampling phase. And almost every day those numbers were approaching the action level um so i wrote to laura trying to get more information about why that would even happen um because as far as I, I knew they had tents up and there was all the safety protocols are in place for sampling um so i was really surprised to see you know taking up small samples like that out of the ground that, that we were seeing levels of mercury. And just to put the numbers in perspective, normal mercury levels, ambient levels, like in New York City, are between five and 10 nanograms. And the peak on the site were numbers between 300 and 900 
nanograms, which is significantly higher than your average daily number. Um, but it didn't hit the 1,000 nanogram level, so it didn't trigger, you know, any sort of warnings. But I think, you know, the one thing that I just wanted to say is I think that we need to be concerned moving into remediation, and, and the community needs to make requests with, you know, Howard Hughes and through the community board that the level of, of remediation is to the best level that it can be. Because if we're seeing levels of mercury approaching the action level during sampling, I think that's concerning. And I just wanted to share this data with you guys. Um, you know, that's what Laura sent me, um, that information. Is that, Alice, is that information, those questions that I wrote with her response, would that be up on the website as well? I can post that as well. Okay, thanks, Diana. Yeah, it'll be in the um, section. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you guys and thank you for helping um, getting that information back to me. Thanks, Maggie, for bringing this all to our attention. Really appreciate your time and effort on that. Um, thank you. Okay, I think we've got Megan Melvern. Hey. Hey there. I just wanted to completely agree that I think it's such a deep email that going over the points right now is, is difficult. So I completely concur with that idea. Um, and then I just wanted to also point out is how awkward the timing is of all of the continued um, requests for Laura's continuation. We've, we've been asking about this from the beginning and it just seems like that every moment there's um, an opportunity for uh, when one contract ends, it just so happens the time with some really important things that are happening otherwise in the community and it just, or, or a different part of the timeline in this whole approval process. It's terrible not to have access, full access to Laura right now. And I know she's doing her full stop best to be um, available to us. So uh, thank you for all your continued work. And I just wanted to say, yay. Good <laughs> Thanks, Megan. And we're certainly trying to stay on it. Um, all right, anybody else on, on this item? I think that's it. All right, well, you know, shy of nine o'clock, I think we can close down this meeting <laughs> happily. Uh, accomplished a lot, I hope, and it was great to see everyone or hear from everyone, and thanks very much for being here, and we'll, we'll see you next month. Thanks so thanks, much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.